Hello, I'm Lisa Wool, the Executive Director at the Nanakook Watershed Alliance. I'd like to thank everyone for participating in the economics and the environment in the Nanakook Watershed webinar today. Uh, we recently worked with University of Delaware to have an economic study done of the Nanakook Watershed. Uh, we want to thank Kelly Jacobs, the grad student, as well as Martha Narvaez, um, Andrew Holmesy, and Jerry Kaufman, who really worked a lot on that project. And we want to thank our sponsors also, the Campbell Foundation and Western Sussex Chamber of Commerce who helped promote this as well. Um, we have a great lineup. As many of you know, we have a wide variety of partners that we work with the Nanakoke. Uh, the Nanakoke is one of the most pristine waterways heading to the Chesapeake, but it also is a big economic driver for the area as well. So we've always understood the value of it as a recreational area and some basic numbers about the economics related to the poultry industry, but we wanted to take a deeper dive into what the value of the river really is to the region economically as well as environmentally. So our speakers today, we actually have Jerry Kaufman and Andrew Holmesy from University of Delaware will be starting and they're going to go over the valuation they did of the Nanakook watershed from an economic perspective in a couple different ways. After that, we're going to have Jim Rapp from Conservation Community Consulting talking about burning economic impacts. Then that will lead us to Holly Porter from the Delmarva Chicken Association, which will be talking about chickens and the Delmarva economy. We will then have Peter Edinger from Bayer Energy Devco, who's going to be talking about a new facility going in the CEPR that's a anaerobic digestion, um, which is used to handle waste management. Um, and then we're going to talk about economic impacts of local fisheries, and that will be led by Fred Pomeroy, a local waterman and fisherman. So we'll get started into that right now. Thank you so much. All right, good. So Andrew and I are going to do this in uh, the 20 minutes or so. We're going to leave uh, uh, 10 minutes for Q&A and that type of thing and then get the ball rolling. Uh, we're one of the National Institutes for Water Resources. There are 54 of them. I have a colleague at K over at the University of Maryland who is the director of the Water Resources Institute there. Uh, so there are 54 of us sprinkled uh, from Delaware, Maine, all the way out to Micronesia. And so we're, uh, we look at research and uh, we train the young scientists and engineers for careers in water resources. So this is a perfect uh, task for us. I see Kelly uh, Jacobs on the call. She was a grad student when she uh, wrote most of this report. And now she's in the uh, PhD program uh, doing some good things as well. So I might, I might call on you, Kelly. Um, All right, sounds good. I hope yeah, I can remember. Good to see you. <laughs> uh, so this well, is the actual infor information graphic that the Nanakoke Watershed uh, Association put together. Uh, there, there are some big numbers, big economic benefits provided by the Nanakoke and its watershed. Uh, you can see in the billions there. We're gonna we're gonna um, go into a little bit about how that how we came to those uh, those numbers there. But you can see that like natural habitat. Uh, the freshwater wetlands, the forest, uh, they, have, they have economic benefits. Uh, wages, jobs and wages significantly. And then looking at things like parks and uh, uh, the uh, fishing, uh, they have up economic activity. And that uh, was really uh, interesting to see once you started adding it all up. And uh, so what, what's interesting is the Nanakoke people, literally this is one of the few rivers left in Delaware and Maryland that are uh, known by their, the indigenous name of the Nanakoke. Many of the rivers have been anglicized, uh, but this is literally the people of the Tidewater. And uh, this is a fascinating history here. And then of course, 40 years ago, John Smith came and uh, explored uh, from Jamestown, uh, sailed up the Nanakoke, he encountered 200 warriors from your information. That's really uh, interesting so that the uh, the area there has been settled by the Europeans for 400 years now, four centuries. Uh, what's interesting in Delaware is it is our largest watershed. Uh, the people up in the Brandywine say, what? Uh, but it, it, it is, it is, it is by, uh, it's like 140 square miles. And uh, it's a vast watershed, 827 square miles. Uh, Delaware is only 2000 square miles. So that's about one third uh, of the, uh, the drainage area is, uh, is that side. So it is a vast watershed. And so how do you feel that? When uh, Andrew took us down to meet Lisa, we did a field recon about a year and a half ago in June when you were able to do that. And we took a wonderful drive from Seaford, Blades, Trap Pond, and we went all the way down to 349, I think, through Bivalve. And we went to the end of the, end of the watershed at the water. And it was 88 miles on the odometer. And uh, you can't go anywhere in Delaware, uh, 88 miles. 
you, you, you'll hit the Delaware, the Chesapeake. So it, it is just an amazingly beautiful watershed. And when you get out to those forests way down there, uh, it feels like you're a million miles away from the world. And that's a beautiful thing. The other thing that's interesting is it's a really flat watershed. Uh, your maximum elevation is only 19.8 feet above sea level. Uh, so it, it may be one of the flattest watersheds around. And uh, that's really interesting as well. Uh, so we looked at economic activity in three different ways, looking at the classic, can you add up the market, non-market value from some of the data sources that we have uh, from the uh, United States Fish and Wildlife Service. We looked at the second, which is the uh, ecosystem services. That's a new term. That's the value of the habitat. We used to think the value of the habitat was free, like air and water and forests. There's no value there, but they have significant economic value. And there's a methodology now that's widely accepted to do that. And then we looked at from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the United States Department of Labor, looking through that, pouring through the databases, Kelly went through and added up all the jobs and wages that we think are watershed related in the, in the five counties of the watershed in the, in the, in the two states. So uh, what's interesting is that there are five you know, county jurisdictions that operate and manage this watershed. And what Lisa does at the Nanticoke is, the, is to uh, make sure they're all rowing in the same direction, uh, which is, uh, is very good as well. So uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew mapped the, uh, the states and uh, the towns there. Um, one of my favorite towns is Bivalve, uh, which is a great name for a town uh, in Maryland. Um, and so about uh, two thirds is Delaware, uh, one thirds in, in Maryland. And you, you can add it up, it's about 827 square miles. There's the map uh, Andrew produced that shows the basic uh, sub watersheds. And you can see what's interesting, it extends uh, far in, inland into Delaware, almost to Georgetown. So that's pretty interesting. And uh, you know, just go west of Milford, you're in, and you're up in Kent County, Delaware, and you're in the watershed. And so then you can go all the way down, all the way down into Maryland to the, to the beautiful Delta there and, uh, and, and, uh, and learn about this. So uh, the thing that is, it's, uh, there are many political jurisdictions in this, uh, in this beautiful watershed that must be managed uh, so that the watershed can be restored and protected. And that's called hydropolitics. Uh, here's the land use mapping that Andrew produced. Uh, and you can see some features there that are very interesting. Half is agriculture, um, of course, and 14% uh, uh, are the mass contiguous forests that you observe, particularly downstream, about 15%. And the thing that really hits home to me is about one quarter is wetlands, uh, freshwater wetlands, for instance, a full one fifth of the watershed is freshwater wetlands. And they're probably the most fragile ecosystems around. Uh, it may, this watershed may have the most amount of freshwater wetlands uh, on the Delmarva Peninsula. And as we'll see now, that, that actually provides a lot of economic benefits. And then the population uh, that Andrew can talk about, um, the population centers there, there are uh, 90,000 people in the watershed. Um, and, uh, you know, it grew about 11,000 people over the decade. And Andrew's uh, collecting more data now for the 2020 census. And it'll be interesting to see how many more people have uh, moved to the beautiful watershed uh, there as, as we talked with remote uh, working and things like that, I imagine People may be coming down and uh, working, working there since you don't have to go in the office in the DC or up to Baltimore. So we looked at classically at use values, it's called market value. That's something we can get a dollar number on. And then non-uses would be, if you ask the person, what would you be willing to pay for clean water? And that's been become more widely accepted after the Exxon Valdez disaster. Uh, when they, uh, they, they ran aground and the U.S. government uh, sued Exxon for damages, uh, the economists came up with a way that uh, said, well, what about all Americans? Even somebody that lives in Delaware, Maryland, we, we think the value of the Exxon Alaska coast is valuable. We'd be willing to pay to keep that pristine. So that's the way that the U.S. government assessed Exxon for the damages. They used the entire population of the United States. So we can use that here. So when we looked at the economic activity and looked at these various categories, water quality, recreation, uh, there's a port in the, in the, uh, in the Nanticoke, uh, about $2.6 billion when you add them all up. 
And uh, when you look at the, uh, the big ones, uh, agriculture, for instance, uh, is about a billion dollar economy. And of course, that the agricultural economy, poultry, et cetera, uh, grain, it depends on a, a clean and abundant source of water, particularly with the growing irrigation that we're seeing from the USDA Ag Census uh, that's needed when we have these uh, hot, dry summers. And irrigation can uh, increase, of course, the yield of corn and soybeans. Uh, uh, and the farmers can say a lot more about this. And you have a longer growing season with that as well. And then there are 50,000 acres of parks where people are coming. That has economic value, like health benefits, and all the way down. And when you add them up, it's about two and a half billion and counting. We, we just stopped because we ran out of time. But you could find other economic drivers there if you keep looking. And that's a big number. So for instance, if you just ask people what they're willing to pay for the population there, the 90,000, 100,000 people that live in the watershed, uh, uh, people are willing to pay about $40 a year for clean water. And you, you get about $17 million in, in economic benefits uh, on willingness to pay. The highest is uh, you'd be willing to pay for the cleanest va uh, value of water, which is to get to swimming, which means the bacteria would be less than 100. Uh, units per 100 milliliters. Uh, of course, potable, you're not going to drink the water from the nanocoat directly. Swimming is the highest value you can shoot for. Of course, fishing and swimming were the goals set by the 1970s Clean Water Act. So I imagine the water quality in the nanocoat is somewhere between fishing and swimming uh, there. Uh, so, you know, we can give that a grade. Swimming, swimming would be like a B, B to a B plus if you're going to grade it. Property value, of course, uh, we know that uh, intuitively the property increases the closer you are to the water. Um, and uh, so Kelly uh, methodically calculated all the area within 2000 feet, about a half mile within the water along that uh, amazingly long shoreline there, uh, 322 miles of shoreline. That may be a record to tell you the truth. Uh, and I uh, looked at the average property value there and calculated the property within that 2000 foot swath is about $80 million benefits as opposed to if you're living further inland. So the, as we know in real estate, the closer you are to the water, you have a, you have a pretty good value there in the Nanocoke. And, and again, Kelly just stopped because we ran out of time. Wastewater, wastewater assimilation benefits about 8 million a year from the five wastewater plants that discharge either into the water or into the, uh, into the, uh, the groundwater. That provides benefits. And then water supply, of course, clean water from the wells there. Uh, we could put a dollar value on that of how much water is sold to the customer, about five dollars a uh, five dollars a million gallons, a uh, thousand gallons, and that's about 1.8 million. And then you get the irrigation, which is really, really important. We can put a irrigation value there, about uh, about four hundred dollars an acre foot of water. That's one acre of land, uh, that's two football fields with one pulled one foot deep, uh, that's about $1.30 dollar, dollar per 1,000 gallons, just valued with that water in the ground. And if you look at the irrigation over three months, and you may be irrigating three inches, a, three inches a month, that's $125 million of water that's sitting there that is, uh, that is economic to be benefit. And, you know, a lot of areas in the country um, that, we, that we know, uh, you know, out west don't have this water. And so that's... <laughs> This, this is as good as gold, this water that's sitting there for irrigation. And then fish and wildlife, of course. Blackwater National Wildlife Re Refuge, where the bald eagles are, is right, out, right on the other side there. And the National Park Service does a good job estimating the economic benefits of the national park system. And the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge is one of the highest visited national park units out of the 400 or so that exist throughout the United States. And it's about $8 million of economic output from the uh, 200 or so uh, thousand vi visitors. So the National Park is an economic driver, as you, as you know very well uh, there. And then the blue crab. So we tried to come up with a way to estimate how many blue crabs would be in the estuary there uh, based on the, uh, uh, the reports that have come from the state of Maryland and Chesapeake Bay. And we, we put that the blue crabs uh, there um, are worth about four and a half million dollars a year in terms of the, uh, the shell fishery there. And that's probably on a low end. And then of course, the, uh, I, I know we're gonna have a talk a little bit later. Uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service does a great job every five years. They, they actually go out and get 
hotel receipts. Uh, they look at uh, fishing stores like uh, Dick's Sporting Goods and, and others, Columbia. They're selling fishing gear, bird watching gear, uh, hunting gear. And these are big numbers in the United States. And in the, in the Nanticoke, uh, when we prorate, it's about $123 million industry. Now, a governor, <laughs> what a governor would do to go out and court an industry uh, to move into a town or a state uh, that would provide this, this economic benefits, uh, you know, any governor would do that and any county executive would do that. And, and Nanticoke is a flora and fauna factory uh, when, it, when it comes to this. And this is real money that's been estimated, not willingness to pay. And then of course the uh, uh, outdoor, I see we're gonna have a talk on the, this beautiful outdoor industry association where they actually don't count like all the, uh, uh, all the sporting gear sold and that is a huge industry in the United States. We incorporated it into the state by state and came up with about 83, $83 million in, um, in that uh, $270 million consumer spending from, uh, and then there's jobs and wages associated. So um, the river, again, is the, and those watershed is the, the source of uh, this outdoor industry, which I just read exceeds in the United States, the energy industry uh, now. So all the energy jobs that we hear about in all the various sectors, renewable and non-renewable fossil fuels is exceeded now by the outdoor industry association or the outdoor industry. And that's saying something. So if you have a beautiful watershed, it, it pays to maintain it that way because it does have these significant economic benefits. And then something that was surprising to me uh, and when we did this and we, we did this was the, uh, where Delaware Maryland ranked in terms of powerboat expenditures by the National Marine Manufacturing Association, Delaware, Maryland are, you know, uh, top in the nation, the top half. And when we prorate it for the uh, Nanticoke, you can see it's like 140 million of power boating. And that's just, just, just the boats themselves. That's re, uh, fixing the boats, the docks, the marinas, everything that's the, the trailers, all, the, all that's associated with it. And then Trap Pond in Delaware, beautiful place. One of the northernmost stands of the bald cypress. Uh, and when you go in and look at them, you know, sitting there in the pond, uh, that the uh, uh, state of Delaware then did a very nice uh, estimate of the uh, using uh, Rockport Analytics, and that's got a uh, spending there. Look at that big number, uh, and that's based on people willing to spend about two hundred fifty dollars a day. You may be staying overnight, that type of thing. So these are economic drivers, and then we get to the big one, ag. Uh, this beautiful agricultural land there, uh, which we'll hear more about in a minute. Uh, that's about $1 billion in farm sales. When we look at the USDA census, and you can see we tabulate about 1,400 farms, prorating again from the five counties, uh, you know, it's big. And so the U, U, University of Delaware College of Ag, uh, Natural Resources did a study that's just for Delaware, and Delaware has, all oh, Delaware has 1.3 billion in sales, mostly from poultry, mostly in Sussex, of course. Uh, and they use the multiplier of eight so the true economic value of agriculture is eight times that because you're talking about all the sourcing of the growers, you're talking about the fertilizer uh, industry. So uh, multiply that eight, million, eight that one billion by eight and you'll come up with a truer number of what the value of agriculture is in the Nanico. And then the and economic benefits of forests, we're recognizing more, uh, more now, this carbon storage, carbon sequestration now, they're trying to store uh, the, uh, you know, the greenhouse gases that come from the fossil fuels. Uh, trees, we're learning, have enormous carbon storage benefits. And, uh, you know, there's a big program now to reforest. Uh, reforest 30% of the United States are protected. It's called 30 for 30 program by 2030. Well, uh, the uh, Nanticoke's Coke's already at, at almost up to 30%. And you can see all the trees there have this huge carbon storage benefits. And that, to me, is a very simple uh, recipe for, for addressing this uh, climate change issue that we have. So you have a lot of trees, and it pays to actually uh, put more trees in. And it's not very costly to put trees in. And we're talking about bringing people like the AmeriCorps, uh, bringing the, uh, the various uh, VISTA and other uh, the veterans coming back from overseas and uh, these are great jobs to have and Nanticoke could be a place to do this. And then the parks, trust for public land, the benefits of parks. There are a lot of parks and open space in the Nanticoke 
And so one of the big one is the health benefits as we're seeing in the pandemic, uh, the parks are an oasis. The parking lots are overflowing. I imagine you're seeing that. And so staying paying to go to a gym and maybe you can't even go to a gym now with the pandemic, you can still do a Stairmaster uh, uh, you know, in the parks by hiking and, and doing things like that. And we're learning that these value, these numbers are probably no now, low now, given that we're in a pandemic. And then port, the port up at Seaford, and just the water sitting there because it's very rare to have a deep water port uh, in, the, in the Chesapeake like this inland where you could ship far inland, 80 miles. Uh, the water that's sitting there has got navigation value about four and a half million dollars based on the use values. So then we get into ecosystem services, uh, but again, the value of the farmland, farmland's over half. Then we have the forest and the wetlands, as we talked about these amazing ecosystems. Like farmland has enormous habitat values because of pollinate, pollinators, uh, the bees. Uh, if you didn't have farms, we wouldn't have pollination, uh, which benefits all of the ecosystems, for instance. So when you look at these numbers and you can do these multipliers, you multiply the dollars per acre per year, and so, here, so here's where the benefit of the freshwater wetlands and the farmland comes into play. Look at that value of the freshwater wetlands, $2 billion. If you had to build, get an engineer to build a wastewater or a water treatment plant to replace and do what a freshwater wetland does in terms of filtering the water, uh, it would cost you about $2 billion to build that, that wastewater plant. So these natural systems are much more cost effective to do that. So when you tabulate it up, you're up at 3.7 billion. We've done some other studies in other estuaries like the Barnegat, uh, the Maryland Coastal Bays, et cetera. And uh, th these numbers aren't anywhere near as high as what the Nanticoke has because of your in-place uh, habitats. Uh, and then when, here's the pie chart that looks at that. Right? Uh, and again, the freshwater wetlands, the farmland and the forest, which you have a lot of uh, provide these uh, really uh, really, really superb economic benefits uh, to see. And then there's the split between the, the two states based on the habitat. So then we look at the third category jobs where Kelly uh, painstakingly poured through the Bureau of Labor Statistics charts for the five counties. These are jobs that are reported monthly by the BLS. Uh, uh, they're non-farm jobs and, we, and what Kelly added them up, there's 5,000 what we call watershed related jobs. Those are things like working in a marina, or if you're working in engineering and working on a wastewater uh, pipeline, uh, we call that water related by the jobs categories and you add them up. And then you do a multiplier because if you're working there and you're working on a water job, you go out and spend and you buy lunch uh, and you spend money in the community, that's called indirect. And so that's about 6,000 jobs. And then we add up all the other jobs that weren't in this Bureau of Labor Statistic category, the fishing, the hunting, these were directly reported by the United States government. Outdoor industry, again, they calculated it. And water supply, if you're working in a watershed organization, Lisa, we counted you. And so you're up to about 19,000 jobs with wages. So uh, the watersheds are a jobs engine in some ways. And uh, you know the idea is that uh, quite possibly there could be more jobs there, outdoor jobs, uh, given that you have this habitat that a lot of other places don't, as we're seeing. So the National, the, uh, National Ocean Economics Program does a good job and looks at these categories here. And just for the counties in the watershed, this is just another way to look at it. They, they use 35,000 people. So that the true value of the jobs supported by a watershed is somewhere around say 20,000 to 35 uh, there with the, with the wages. And uh, you know, as, as the, as the uh, senators say, and it's all about jobs, jobs, jobs. If you can put the natural systems into a jobs language, uh, people sit up and take notice in, uh, you know, in the capitals. So when all said and done, looking at this in three separate ways, and uh, I give all the props to Kelly uh, and Andrew for uh, doing all the heavy lifting on this, um, and Martha, uh, working with Lisa, uh, the, 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 the economic value of the first category that we put a dollar amount on and ask people what they're willing to pay is 2.6 billion. Uh, the ecosystems part is over 3 billion. And then the jobs and wages is uh, about 20,000 jobs will claim about $460 million in wages. So no matter how you cut it uh, uh, and how, the, how you debate it, uh, the, the Nanakoke is, is a, a very valuable watershed 
uh, you know, worth its weight in gold. It is a true flora and fauna factory. Uh, and then these are the excellent uh, products that the Nanticoke Woodish Alliance produced to get this word out to the public to take this kind of techno -eco economic language that we tend to use with all the acronyms and put it in a, a plain English, which I always appreciate. And uh, that's good writing, Lisa. So, you know, with that, uh, any questions, uh, comments for Andrew and Kelly? Yeah, if people want to raise their hand or put a question in the chat. We'll do questions if we have time in between speakers, but we'll also do it at the end if anyone, if we have time, if anyone thinks of anything. Okay. Yeah, hope they get down there soon. Great. Any questions from the group? Oh, mm. yes. Uh, the Is the full study available somewhere? And the answer is yes, it's on the Nanticoke, uh, it's www.nanticokeriver.org website. We also are recording this. So we're gonna have this available as well with the full report um, so that people can check that out. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. With that, I think we'll move on to our next speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Rapp is with Conservation Community Consulting and he is going to talk about birding economic impacts and ecotourism. All right. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. All right. I'm going to do my screen share. By the way, Jerry, perfect segue. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Do that one, this, and... Okay. Can you see it there, Lisa? We can see um, your oh, background no. and your presentation. How about now? Good? Oh, perfect. All right, great. I finally figured it out. Uh, I've been lucky in uh, COVID. I've only had to do this one other time with Ed Lewandowski. It's my second Zoom. So I apologize to all of you who have been living on Zoom for the last uh, year. Um, anyway, yeah, my name is Jim Rapp. I think I know a few folks that are here today. Um, Conservation Community Consulting is a little business that I work with with my buddy Dave Wilson there on the right with our buddy Duke Marshall on one of our uh, Smith Island birding tours. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so anyway, we work with towns like Laurel, Delaware, uh, but also we run birding tours uh, here on the peninsula and actually in Baltimore. So I wanna talk, and I, I really do appreciate what Jerry said. I'm gonna start with some national level stuff about the uh, economics of outdoor recreation, bring it down to national birding statistics, and then talk locally about the kind of things we do and how you know we can benefit uh, in the Nanticoke watershed with promoting not just birding tourism but outdoor recreation in general. So, so that slide says it right there. This is from the Daily Beast in 2019. I, I think when you think about birding, and I consider myself a birder, I am self-labeled, uh, you know, you, you may picture, uh, gosh, Miss Jane Hathaway from the Beverly Hillbillies or some other character from TV, you know, we're nerdy, we love it. It's all fine with us, but we're quiet. We, we get up early and get out. We, we sneak out before the sun gets too hot. We go back out again at night to chase owls and rails. So you just don't see birders in big groups very often. Big groups aren't conducive to birding. However, collectively, we're a really big group. So that's the headline of this program. So yeah, birding is a multi-billion dollar tourism, eco, uh, eco-tourism industry. Um, we travel the world. Oh my gosh, I have friends um, who are guides who go to the uh, both poles, the wildest parts of all the continents to see birds, to take customers there. So locally, nationally, internationally, birding is huge. Um, and it's just kind of funny to me because, you know, growing up, I'm from Salisbury. Um, I like birds. I used to work at the Salisbury Zoo. I liked animals. I never thought about birding till college. But when I went out and saw my first scarlet tanager through binoculars, it changed my life. And I was a senior in college and started birding. We started an event not too much longer after that. But this is a group of folks actually on a bridge that could be right there in the Nanticoke. But I'll be honest, this is in uh, on the Pocomoke River in Snow Hill, Maryland. But yeah, we get out, we get up early with our very expensive binoculars, ever shopped for scopes or, or really expensive or really good binoculars. And we just want to see little birds and big birds, a little immature magnolia warbler. So, you know, as you can probably see, and back to Jerry's talk, you know, our peninsula, and then a watersheds right in the middle, we've got six national wildlife refuges like Blackwater, Shinkatig, Bombay Hook. Uh, 
oh my gosh, how many state parks, state wildlife hunting areas, all kinds of public and private lands back to our farms, and we do take birders on farms, uh, they're everywhere. And you know, with the population of the US as it is, you know, we're, we're all within a few hours really of New York, Philly, Baltimore, Washington, and those folks come here, we know to our beaches, but also to come down and go bird watching. So the more we can do through tourism to bring those folks here, the more our local economies will benefit. So I believe this goes right into something Jerry talked about. I, I, I have not, I'm not an economist. I should have started by saying that. I'm a bird watcher with a little business, but uh, I do pay attention. And this is a, a kind of the glossy Reader's Digest version of the 2017 Outdoor Industry Association report. So these slides will illustrate something Jerry said. So yeah, collectively, all the outdoor recreation, $887 billion. That's a lot of money, that's a big industry. 7.6 million jobs, $65 billion in federal tax revenue, 59 billion in state and local. So those are billions, almost all of them. There's 1 million there, but that's billions of dollars uh, generated by people like a lot of us who enjoy spending time outdoors. So there's kind of some of those sports or outdoor pastimes in general, of course, camping, hunting, fishing. You'll see wildlife watching over there to the right. So beyond birds, of course, people also go to see wild horses at Assateague or elk in Western Pennsylvania or seals. We'll talk about that in a second. So there's lots of animals that people, Americans and international customers or travelers want to see. So I'm gonna leave this one up here a little bit longer. This I think is really cool. And Jerry hinted at this. Uh, if you collectively add it up, outdoor recreation is an $887 billion industry, but compared to pharmaceuticals, motor vehicles, gas and fuel, it's monstrously bigger and just under financial services and insurance. So when we talk about Wall Street and hedge funds, man, we are right there. I think the trouble with most of us is we just don't think about it that way. Hunting's over here, fishing's over there. Who knows where the heck bird watching is, but boy, you add it up. It's a lot of money. And as, as Jerry said, any governor, any mayor would be thrilled to develop these businesses in their towns and in their waterways. So we'll hopefully are helping with that a little bit. A um, couple more numbers that I won't read to you. I'll just focus at the bottom. You know, wildlife watching, you know, gear and accessories, as I hinted at a minute ago. People that get into birding, you start with your $60 pair of Nikons from Dick's Sporting Goods, but boy, you can get up to a couple thousand dollar pair real fast. Scopes, cameras, all that good stuff. Uh, outdoor gear, you know, birders have their own hats and vests they like to wear. It's kind of a funny outfit. But anyway, so a lot of gear is spent. You know, we travel, so, you know, $17 uh, billion in travel expenses there. So $30 billion from wildlife watching. Again, big numbers. Um, and the other part of that, you know, bro breaking it out, retail spending, uh, again, $30 billion, $235 million jobs. 8 billion in salaries and wages, you know, I'm reading numbers to you, but just wildlife watching alone, uh, in, in addition to water sports, fishing, hunting, it's massive. So we certainly do benefit from that and on along the Nanticoke, <clears throat> but we certainly could benefit more. So I'll go from the National Outdoor Recreation. I, I haven't looked at Delaware's yet and I apologize, but I, I know that in Maryland, Governor Hogan a few years ago appointed a commission that he called the Moore Commission for the Maryland Outdoor Recreation Economic Commission. It's a joint commission kind of headed by, it was like DNR, tourism and commerce. And I loved it. I wasn't a part of it. I got to talk a similar talk to them a few years ago, but in this report, they laid out some plans of how Maryland could benefit more from planning around attracting tourists to our state who do all these things we're talking about. Uh, I'm sure Delaware has similar programs. I just didn't get a chance to look at those. And the, oh, by the way, I'll mention the, all these uh, links are on our website, which I'll get to in a second. So to get out of the numbers, but again, Jerry mentioned sort of the imperative here, and I, I believe my friend Karen McGrath is on the call, so I won't, on the Zoom today. I got to thank our senators in Delaware, uh, Senator Carper particularly, who's been out with us birding a couple of times, Maryland, Virginia, all the states in the peninsula, you know, it, there, there's real benefit to us in protecting land and open space and water. And we know this, I think most of us on the call today know this, but if we plan well and can develop some infrastructure limited around getting people outside, whether that's kayak ramps on the Nanticoke or, uh, or birding trails through uh, tourism maps or just websites and promotions, we stand to benefit greatly. So there's a real mandate uh, by protecting the jobs. We don't talk enough about that in our birding world, protect the jobs that we provide. Um, so anyway, I really like that slide. 
bird watching. So separate study also on our website, uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service every five years, along I think the Census Bureau does a, a report on the economics of hunting, fishing and wildlife associated recreation. There's lots of great reports out there, as Jerry mentioned. There's one on national wildlife refuges. There's independent ones. There's one for Assateague in Maryland. But on bird watching, <clears throat> 86 million Americans uh, bird watch. So in this report, and there's the, the cover of the study, uh, the new one should be out soon. I haven't seen it. It takes a while to crunch the numbers. So if anybody on here knows it, you can email me. I'd love to see it. And I can, of course, Google that. But take a look at this little chart. So wildlife watching, in the headline, it mentioned a 20% jump. So you can see there, 2006, 2011, 2016. In numbers, in days away from home to go wildlife watching, but more so in that right column. A lot more money is being spent uh, by Americans traveling to see wildlife, to view wildlife. Um, and that's pretty important. Uh, so that, again, just leads up to this sort of argument or this uh, belief we have that it's important to protect spaces and wildlife for wildlife watching. But there's another part of this that some folks here probably recognize, but many may not, is that on the fishing and hunting side, fishing is doing well, uh, kind of flatlining a bit, but hunting is way down. And I, I love hunters. I don't hunt myself. I fish a little bit. I'm a bird watcher but we need more hunters out there and we need a way for wildlife watchers to pay into the federal system because most of, even on the Nanticoke, if you look at Phillips Landing and uh, the little um, Ed Coke area, halfway down Broad Creek and a few others, a lot of those public boat landings and the, the wildlife areas are paid through Pittman-Robertson Act and other sources of state and federal funding. And uh, when you see a decrease in hunting, that means you're less money out there for wildlife conservation. So. Uh, we need more hunters, but we also need a way for wildlife watchers to pay into the system, in my opinion. Okay, so here's a list of some others. I'll update this, but on our website, we have those from anyone that wants to see these out. Our website is delmarvabirding.com. And I'll talk to you now about what we do and what we've been doing for about 25 years. Um, so yeah, 25 years ago when I was a young bird watcher and I met people like Ed Lewandowski and Dave Wilson and uh, I think Anthony Gonzin's on the call here and other friends, we got interested working in tourism. I was a zoo director at Salisbury at the time in developing birding. And so at one point we published a bird watcher's guide to Delmarva. We printed it. It came out right before the internet happened. <laughs> so there's no website for it. The books are still out there if you can find one in like a, a national park book shop. But anyway, but we started this birding weekend in conjunction with the uh, Ward Museum carving show. So I love to, we'll talk about birding and culture and heritage. They all tie together very, very well. So yeah, so 25 years ago in the spring, the fourth weekend in April, uh, in conjunction with the Ward Museum show in Ocean City that brings in tourists from all over the world. We started running field trips uh, locally, uh, Worcester County and Sussex County mostly. Uh, spring is a great time to get in a canoe or a kayak to seek these little guys. I got to throw some bird pictures in here. This is a bright gold male prothonotary warbler. They arrive mid-April usually, the males come in first. They love cypress. So the Nanticoke, the Pocomo, the headwaters of those two rivers are kind of come out of the dismal or the uh, the great cypress swamp in Delaware is loaded with these guys and we still do this trip we get out there in our kayaks and they're pretty low forest birds so they zip between the kayaks if you're in a two-seater they'll zip between you and your partner it's wild but they're so uh aggressively setting up territory they're almost oblivious to us in late April it's really a blast and that's just one of the birds our record in that April weekend is 204 species so we started this event a long while back. I want to give a shout out to several folks here. I wrote some names down of the old board of Delmarva Low Impact Tourism Experiences, a now uh, defunct organization, but was designed uh, to promote sort of outdoor tourism on the peninsula. So uh, Dave Wilson, my buddy, uh, business partner, Ed Lewandowski, Karen McGrath, Kate Patton, Scott Thomas, a bunch of folks there on the call. And uh, we started taking this birding weekend a little bit further afield. So uh, about six years ago, uh, Dave and I said, we know we're gonna keep doing this, but why don't we try to make a little money at it? Because quite honestly, we did it voluntarily for 20 years, still do a lot of volunteer work, but we took it over as a business. So we expanded, you know, birding, as most of you know, is not just about the spring. Migration's cool, spring in the fall, but man, summertime. So that first slide I showed, or second showed uh, my buddy Duke Marshall, out on Smith Island, we take people out, we hire watermen, we get in their skiffs, you can't see, I think that's either, Captain Eddie or somebody behind the, the ladies there, their cameras, 
but pelicans, oh my God. This is an experience for us that people have told me rivals going to the Galapagos. When you get out in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, just actually south of Smith Island, um, not far from the mouth of the Nanticoke out there. And there's other islands too, like Hooper's, what's left of Hooper's Island and uh, uh, oh my, South Marsh Island, a few others. Um, the pelicans have taken over. And this is a bird that is fairly new to the Chesapeake. They only started nesting in the region in the late eighties. And now there are thousands of them. So we take people out there safely to photograph these birds with those little hearts on their backs are probably seven to eight weeks old, I think. And we cruise by, get pictures, we go back to Tylerton, we eat Smith Island cake, we eat crab cakes. It's just a fantastic day. And we didn't get to do any last year because of COVID, but we hope to get back out there this summer. So that's a summertime thing. Uh, Smith Island Pelican Tours was brand new for us, extremely fun, extremely popular. Uh, we charter, by the way, I should go back, uh, uh, head boats all the time. We don't have our own boats. Dave and I own our own kayaks, that's it. So we're chartering fishing boats, we're chartering kayak companies, we're chartering watermen to take us out. Here's an example of a tour that Dave does behind Ocean City and Assateague, a uh, similar style, a beautiful sunset cruise to, oh, backwards, to go see colonies of nesting, little blue herons, snowy egrets, cattle egrets, great egrets. I think there's like six species in this slide um, of birds that nest on little spoil islands. These are dredges, so back to the economy, when we dredge, uh, the intercoastal waterway and the inland bays and the coastal bays or the port of Baltimore, you know, where Poplar Island is and build these islands that are dredge spoil. They're incredibly productive nesting habitat for birds. So we take people out there too. Um, we took the show to Baltimore. Actually, I split my time between Baltimore and Salisbury. We work with Audubon, uh, Patterson Park Audubon to uh, do a birding weekend there, even in the urban spaces like Baltimore. These little green spaces like Silver and Arboretum are loaded with birds. We did this event in the spring and the fall, and it's just a tremendous fun. Birds are everywhere, no matter where you live, city parks, county parks, big refuges. So uh, I like that we're able to do that as well. Now, this is exciting. We're in the middle of winter. I don't know how many of you know what that bird is. Uh, some of the hunters might, and certainly the birders do. But we get some really unusual waterfowl uh, in the winter. Most people know especially in the Nanticoke, that winter waterfowl come in uh, you know, November, stay through till about March. You can see, oh my gosh, 30 species if you know where to go. This beautiful male harlequin duck uh, is a bird we see off the inlets, uh, mostly on the, Atlantic, on the Atlantic side in the Delaware Bay, not so much in the Nanticoke. They like rocks, so jetties, breakwaters. Uh, we also get seals. You know, this is a thing we've done, this is off of Lewis. Um, we're doing trips right now and have an event in early March. Seals love the breakwaters off Lewis. So these boat tours that we do in January and March during the coldest times of the year are really great times to go out and view seals. Now, where's Scott Thomas? There's Scott in the red coat there with his little shock up there. Uh, you know, you get out there and you got to dress for it. We're outside most of the time, but it's well worth it. So the first year we did this to kind of show you how this business can grow, we had, I think, 30 people. One trip, we were happy. Oh my God, 30 people went birding in January on a fishing boat, uh, the Thelma Dale out of Lewis. Third year, we sold out the big boat, 126 people. So that's just a photograph that shows you how many people will come to Delmarva to do this. And we're getting better at this. We're still new. I say, even though we've been doing it for 25 years, but it's incredible to see the response. And I can't show you how happy they all are. You can sort of see it, but the smiles, the, oh my God, it's just an incredible experience. Um, so lately, let's talk about other things. Let's, who likes beer? We all love our buddies at Dogfish Head and Milton and Rehoboth. They're now getting involved. If you have been paying attention to Dogfish Head in this last couple of months, they've aligned their marketing with Patagonia. You probably know the brand. You may own Patagonia Coats. They're now promoting Dogfish Head, and I'm not going to speak for them, but as a beer brand as a great off-centered ale that goes well with the outdoors. And they're now getting involved in birding. I never would have thought about it, even though for many years, we've taken our birders to Dogfish Head to go celebrate after a day of birding. It's just so much fun working with this wonderful local company to promote the region for birders. And yes, birders like beer too. So we always finish, we try to finish our days with a beer, even in uh, COVID, we're masked up, we go in, we se separate, but uh, we're able to enjoy a drink together. Uh, back to heritage, and I'm going to jump into the Nanticoke. Um, and Lisa, I can see you. Give me that. I think I'm good on time, but give me the cutoff if we need to. <laughs> good. So just this year, you know, even in COVID, you know, we were shut down like a lot of business businesses were back in uh, March. Um, 
just figuring it all out. By June, we had some guidance that we could start running small group tours when the restaurants open up a little bit. We have COVID guidelines, face masks, hand sanitizer, social distancing. But it's been kind of an interesting time to experiment with new tours. So back to Blackwater. Thank you, Jerry. We have started running tours with our friends at Harriet Tubman Tours to merge birding with the history of this incredible American hero, Harriet Tubman. Uh, if you know Blackwater and some of the Harriet Tubman heritage sites, where she was raised as a young girl, an enslaved girl, is right next to the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. So working with Harriet Tubman Tours, Alex and Lisa Green, we start there. We do the wildlife drive. We finish in Cambridge. Uh, it's a four-hour trip. It's been selling out even in COVID. People love this. These experiences are marketable and they sell. So others can take the model. We're just happy we get to do it as well. Uh, we love to work with small towns. I'll jump over to the Atlantic side a bit. You know, we've been working with small towns like Berlin and Rehoboth and Milton for years. Uh, Berlin puts out signs for us. Berlin welcomes birders. It's amazing how a little hospitality like that goes a long way when people are in town shopping, drinking, and eating. But let's talk about the Nanticoke. Um, so a couple of years ago, 2016, working with um, Delaware Sea Grant and the Sustainable Coastal Communities Program, we work with some stakeholders to design a nature and heritage tourism plan for Lowe, right there at the head of the Broad Creek, massive tributary of the Nanticoke. You can see, as Jerry mentioned, Captain John Smith, we've got kayakers in the shot, and there's that little prothonotary warbler again. Um, you know, the Broad Creek, and we've done paddling trips, so I'll jump into that a bit. When we're paddling, of course, we're looking at birds, talking about history. Uh, on the Broad Creek, you it's just gorgeous. It's a beautiful shot that... Uh, Paula Shannon, a good friend, took actually won an award for this picture. That's the Broad Creek, by the way. That's not some river out west or up in New England. That's Laurel, Delaware, just down from the town a little bit. Uh, there's the marker at Phillips Landing right there at the mouth of the Nanticoke. Uh, Captain John Smith actually set foot there and maybe buried an iron cross. I, I'm not sure. But, uh, but there's all this rich history there in the Nanticoke that people really love to hear these stories when they're on the water. I mean, it's one thing to hear it in a PowerPoint like this, but boy, it's fun to get outside and see where these people in history actually set foot. Um, Harriet Tubman also used the Nanticoke. I didn't know that until recently. She, uh, one of the uh, young slaves she helped escape from her home area near Bucktown, I believe, was a young girl named Tilly. And she was brought up in Nanticoke. She was hidden in a hotel in, she and Harriet hidden in a hotel in Seaford on the Nanticoke. And believe me, this Harriet Tubman Byway tourism is really catching on. So there's all sorts of other uh, historical ways to promote the river. Um, so we talk about this on our river tours, but just the beauty of it all. And there's a, some smiling faces. So we've done a lot of paddling trips on Broad Creek. And a couple of years ago, um, I had a group of road scholars. This is a program uh, used to be called Elder Hostel. People traveled in from all over the country, uh, mostly the Eastern states, but I had Florida, I think Tennessee, up in New England had come down for a week. We stayed in Rehoboth, we biked at Cape Henlopen, went birding, but we spent a day in Laurel on the Broad Creek. And for this six day program, every single person when they surveyed said that was their favorite day. So not the beaches for this group, it was Broad Creek. It was kayaking on the Broad Creek, having drinks and dinner at Abbott's on Broad Creek at the end of the day, which we love to do. Um, so, you know, you can put these things together and it's not too hard to market. So, I think I have an announcement to make for some folks here. I'm pleased to tell you today, for those that don't know, that thanks to a community economic resilience grant from University of Delaware Sea Grant uh, to the Laurel Redevelopment Corporation, uh, they're su to support a paddling eco sports startup, Quest Kayak will be in Laurel this summer. Uh, they are setting up shop. Uh, it's a, anyway, I'll fill you in the details later. I'm running out of time probably, but. In Broad Creek, Quest, if you know Matt Carter and his crew, they do a great job uh, running tours. We worked for them for years. So this summer, you're going to have a chance to go paddling right there in, in Laurel with a very well-known, well-respected paddle sports outfitter, who, by the way, will be talking about Banana Coat to his customers in Rehoboth and Lewis, too. So really big opportunity for the river. Um, I'll finish with this, and then I'll take questions. So back to history, you know, here's the Broad Creek again, kind of uh, right, actually leaving Laurel. And this is a little bit of history I think is so fascinating. It's got nothing at all to do with birds, but I believe right beyond or right there where that little old spring bridge is, is the only spot in the US where a railroad engine fell on top of a schooner. The Norfolk, Norfolk Express accident of on the Broad Creek in 1904. 
These pictures are in Laurel in the Historical Museum. Uh, I think there's a big frame of this in Abbott's on Broad Creek, the restaurant. But people are fascinated by these stories of all sorts. The shipbuilding on Beth at Bethel on the Broad Creek, Harriet Tubman, John Smith, the birds. So uh, with that, thank you all the photographers. I don't take pictures myself. So a lot of folks here help me with this. And, uh, and I'll wrap it up with that. That's our website again. The resources are on the About Us section of the website. Um, Lisa, is okay, time-wise? Yeah, you're great. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Lisa. Did anyone have any questions for Jim? It's a quiet group this today. <laughs> uh, hi, this is Monica from Bioenergy. Hello, Monica. I just, hi there. I just wanna say it's awesome to see a birding person on an economic forum. <laughs> That's awesome. So I, I bring my binoculars every time I'm in Seaford. So thank you so much for talking about how important it is for us birding people to the economy because we I feel much better about myself right now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> a, a little a little honor and courage today. No, me too. I mean, I love giving this talk. And I, I, one person I want to thank, I think it's Nicole, Memo Dereker, by the way, helped us get those Smith Island tours going. So Memo, if you're out there, thank you, buddy, at Beacon uh, Salisbury University. You're most welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Memo. Great. This has been like a nice little reunion for a bunch of us. I know. It's <laughs> so um, if there are, are there any other, does uh, someone have a question? Yeah, Lisa, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Um, I, I was just wondering, it's sort of interesting that um, the increase that you've seen since 06, I guess mainly in, in bird watching and, and wildlife watching, and there's kind of been a concurrent decrease in hunting. Do you think yes. that it's maybe filling in the slack or people are sort of shifting or it's a different different um, group, because I know some of the, the hunting uh, folks have noticed a kind of a drop off, which, you know, whatever you think about hunting, it does have an economic impact. Absolutely. I, I'll, I'll give my answer. And I've read a little bit about this. I think the average age of the American hunter is somewhere like 62 or 63 years old. It's, a, it's I, I hearken it to, and I live in, again, live in Salisbury and Baltimore. I kind of spent my time Birding has really picked up in the urban areas. Like a lot of people that live in, I know our customers in DC, Baltimore, Philly, love coming down to the shore, love coming to the Nanticoke to explore. And certainly our local people do as well. And I don't think those urban folks are hunting as much. Uh, fishing they'll do. I think it's something you gotta be taught as a kid. And I know there's a lot of great youth hunting programs out there, but all the things I've read, and there was a big story on NPR a few years ago about this. I was gonna share it today, but that talked about that and the decline in revenue. In fact, as what I said about the conservation program supported by hunting, I just think it's time to get more kids outside doing anything. And also combined with video games and online, it's, it's a, a bad time to get p kids interested in the outdoors. So, but we can do better with it. I, I can talk a lot about the challenges of hunting if uh, you want. But Please, you have time, absolutely. Well, you're, you're right. You know, the average age of a hunter is kind of like the average age of a farmer. And if you didn't get introduced to it as a kid, you know, how do you go just start doing it on your own? You know, the, the entry threshold is really tough. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the number one reason that uh, people give up hunting is lack of access to where to do it. Mm -hmm. Used to be, you know, when I was a kid, you'd walk up to any farm, knock on the door and say, I'd like to go hunting. And you betcha, you know, now you knock on the door and say, sure, I need a thousand dollars. Oh, sure. And uh, so that's, that's different. This year, hunting is way up. It's up about 30%. Um, and um, the average age is down 20 years. Uh, so, you know, who knows? Uh, maybe this year's changed that because it was designated as an essential activity and nobody was prohibited from doing it like they were from other things. Who knows how long that'll last? Thank you, Alex. That's excellent to hear. Great. Thank you, Alex. Any other questions? Okay, we have one here. I believe kayak, oh, I lost it. I believe most kayakers, paddlers would pay registration fee to support conservation activities was a comment. No child left inside. Yeah, right. Um, Kenny also mentioned, um, join the scouts. Which hey, is okay, a Kenny, I know Kenny. <laughs> right, right, Kenny, excellent. I uh, agree with idea. all of those. One thing that I think very few people know is hunters uh, self-imposed a fairly major tax on all hunting and fishing equipment. So um, if I buy uh, some bullets to target shoot, there goes 15% uh, 
uh, straight to wildlife conservation. Uh, if, uh, if I buy a rifle or a shotgun, there goes 15%, a bow and arrow, 15%. If I buy a pair of binoculars, zero. Excellent point. It's put to conservation. Right. I can add a little bit of that if I have a minute. Uh, years ago, there was an effort to do that. It was called Teaming with Wildlife. Uh, it was sort of, again, tax certain types of outdoor equipment. I remember it worked well back in the 90s, and it, it had a good, strong support. But at that time, because it was a tax and because of the government, no one wanted to do it. I think Pittman Robertson was passed a long while back. Uh, so anyway, a lot of birders were supportive. I know all the ornithological societies and bird clubs were involved. So currently there's a bill called the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, different, it's not a tax for on binoculars or field guides, but it is supposed to generate income for non-game wildlife. I certainly know that the birds I enjoy, I'm enjoying them on the back of the tax set hunters and fishermen pay and anglers pay. Um, so hopefully the Recovering America's Wildlife Act will do more to broaden that scope for all the other rare animals that aren't hook and bullet species. But I agree, if we have some kind of a way to assess a uh, small tax on those items, I'd be happy to pay them. The principal group that killed that tax was the uh, outdoor retailers, Yep. <laughs> which is pretty funny considering the uh, head of REI became the Secretary of Interior. Oh, you know, Alex, you know well. I remember. <laughs> WTF, you know? I remember it. Yep, it was a real bummer to see that happen. I totally agree. Hey, Lisa, real quick, I'd be remiss if I sat here and didn't thank Jim Rapp for everything he did on Scouts. Thank you, Jim, for all the help, always. Oh, Kenny, Kenny's uh, speaking to the other thing I do, and that's the Hazel Outdoor Discovery Center in Eden. If you don't know about that, hazeloutdoors.org. We offer free camping to Scouts. So, Kenny, thank you, buddy. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. This has been really a great discussion. And Thanks. so this actually leads us to our, thank you so much, Jim. This leads us to our next presenter, Holly Porter. Um, she's with the Delmarva Chicken Association, previously DPI. Um, and she's gonna actually be talking about um, the chickens and the Delmarva economy, which is a huge deal down here. Are you able to so take slightly, over, Holly? <laughs> I think so. So a slightly different kind of bird uh, that we'll be talking about. and. My presentation doesn't have nearly uh, the amount of interesting photos in it that was in the last. So I'll apologize for that. Hopefully everyone can see my presentation. Yep, looks good. Wonderful. And, and uh, hopefully everything will work. Literally 15 minutes before I was about to go on, my internet literally crashed. So I'm working off of a hot spot and I'll keep my fingers crossed that everything works. So again, hello, I'm Holly Porter. I'm the executive director of the Delmarva Chicken Association, formerly the Delmarva Poultry Industry Incorporated. We went through a rebranding at the end of November. And uh, we, the trade association that represents our uh, farmers, our uh, chicken companies, and the allied businesses that are all part of our chicken community, as you can see here from this first slide. And before we really go into the economics of the chicken community, we would be remiss to say that uh, the people really and truly are a big part of this community. Uh, we have nearly 1,300 family farmers. Uh, there are five chicken companies in our area. We have about 18,000 employees that are employed directly with those companies. And then of course, our community also involves partnerships with universities, with governments and hundreds of other allied businesses as well too. So it's not just about, about the numbers, it's also a people and really the, the farmers, the employees, they are all the heart of our chicken community here on Delmarva. And many people who maybe aren't familiar with the area have to wonder, well, why do we have such a strong uh, chicken industry in our area? And really it's because it got started right here uh, in Ocean View, Delaware, uh, back in 1923 when Cecil Steele uh, ordered 50 chicks and received 500. Um, and instead of raising the, the uh, or using the chicks for eggs, she decided to raise them to a market weight um, where they then were sold into some of the urban city area. And she was able to make significantly more money uh, with that meat chicken than she was on the eggs that she would have had. So that was, was really how it got started and why it's so big in our area. We also talk a lot about our three-legged stool. And it's very important to remember our Delmarva economy is built off of the chicken farmers it's built off of the crop farmers that are providing the feed and it's built off of the chicken companies. And so all three of these uh, stool or legs of the stool are so important to our economy. And if any one of them was to be broken or to have difficulties, 
then the whole stool would really fall apart. So in our area, we are blessed that we have five companies uh, working within Delmarva. It is not always the case in other uh, states or other areas where there's a chicken community. We have Alan Haram, we have Amic Farms, Mount Air Farms, Purdue Farms, and Tyson uh, Farms also has a, a plant in the Eastern Shore of Virginia area. So let's get into the numbers because that's what we're talking about, some of our economics. Uh, these numbers were just tallied as of about three weeks ago. Um, we at the Delmarva Chicken Association has been pulling statistics from all of our uh, companies since the 1950s. And each year we put those together. Um, and these are our 2020 numbers. I will say that uh, COVID, like most uh, areas, had definitely had an impact on us. We saw about a 6% decrease in the amount of chickens that were raised in 2020. We're at 570 million. Uh, we were close to 605 million last year. Uh, the, 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 we raised about 4.2 billion pounds of chicken, uh, which only slightly decreased um, versus the, what was produced. And again, we did that with about 1,300 family farmers and we have about 18,000 uh, company employees within our area. Our GDP or wholesale market value did decrease slightly, um, again, with impacts due from COVID uh, down to 3.4 billion. We were at 3.5 billion last year as well. So again, the, the chicken industry is very much a big part of the economies within, especially Delaware and Maryland, where we're talking about the Nanico watershed runs through. It's 70% of Delaware's cash farm income and about 35% of Maryland's. And then when you add on to that, the grain side of, of our three-legged stool, those numbers definitely shoot up as well too. So I'll break it down briefly. These are numbers specific to Maryland. Um, so in, nine, in 2019, we had uh, over 200 uh, chicken houses. We were down to about 2,100 uh, in 2020. We have about uh, 614 growers, family farmers in 2019. That number did go up slightly in 2020 to 630. Uh, the other big piece of this again is, is the economics. And I think Jerry really set it up when you talk about you know, your direct numbers, your supplier, your induced and what that total is. So again, in Maryland, there are 6,000 jobs that are tied directly to the chicken industry. Uh, then we have those supplier and those deuce numbers. So again, you have your uh, rural farms where the, uh, the chicken, uh, somebody in a chicken truck may be stopping and getting lunch. So you know, those numbers are calculated in. And as you can see in Maryland specifically, it's a $2.7 billion uh, economy. And it's not just the economic side of it as well too. Keep in mind that there are uh, good jobs, wages and benefits that are paid, um, especially by our chicken companies. And there is a lot of taxes that go back to supporting um, our communities, whether that's the federal taxes at 309 million or 215 million in state and local taxes, which again goes back to our communities and the, the economics of the area. You can see this is a similar number for Delaware, um, slide for Delaware as well. And again, very similar uh, numbers. We do have more processing plants in Delaware than we do in Maryland. So you see those direct numbers uh, are very much tied to that having more uh, employees and, and jobs tied to it. And uh, we also have more um, growers. Uh, Sussex County is still the number one county uh, with the, the concentration amount of chicken farms. Uh, so Delaware is the first state and we're still the number one county when it comes to producing chickens as well too in that county. So it's about a $7.2 billion total uh, impact, economic impact in Delaware. And again, you see a you know, significant amount of uh, taxes that are returned both at the federal and at the state and local level as well. So I shared earlier just the snapshot of where we were in 2020, but I think it's really important that we look at trends. As I shared, we've been collecting data for a number of years since the 1950s. And I've heard oftentimes where there are folks out there saying there's this tremendous growth, this runaway growth, whatever term you may want to use in our chicken uh, industry. And that's not exactly the case at all when you take a look at the trends. As a matter of fact, our highest numbers of chickens produced across Delmarva was in 1995. 
and a lot has changed since 1995. A lot has changed in how uh, our farms are set up uh, with the regulations, stormwater management, um, laws, and, and a lot of things that have happened on the farm that are just so much better uh, for the environment and for efficiency's sake as well too. So again, you'll see down in 2010, there was a dip in numbers. A lot of that also is the same time frame where our grain prices uh, were much higher. Uh, grain and feed is the number one expense to raising chickens. So when you saw the, the grain prices rising, you saw a decrease in the amount of chickens that are produced. And really what you were seeing um, into last year before COVID was that we were starting to get back to that plateau part uh, of you know, even the 1995 numbers. So again, what was really uh, termed as runaway growth is really just growth getting us back to the point of where we were prior to feed prices being so high. And we're doing that, we're producing more birds with less farmers. So again, if you look at the numbers in, in 1995, we're at about 2,800 farmers uh, that were raising birds and now we're down to about 1,500. So again, there are less, uh, less farmers that are producing those chickens and there are less chicken houses uh, that are producing those chickens as well too. Again, in 1995, we were pushing about 6,500 chicken houses and now we're pushing around 5,000 or so. So again, those farms, those chicken houses are larger in size than they would have been in 1995, but there are also, again, less of them and in more of the, uh, in more direct area as well too. One thing that has increased is the amount of meat that is produced. So in my mind, this slide really talks about efficiency. It talks about how uh, we are again uh, producing, you know, we've raised around the same amount of birds or even less since 1995. We have less farmers doing it and, and they're doing it in less chicken houses, but we're able to produce a more efficient amount of pounds from each one of those birds. And a lot of that really weighs into um, how well, again, the technologies that are out there, it comes down to to feed and nutrition, it comes down to the houses that we have um, that are, you know, a lot more efficient. Um, it comes down to decreased mortality that we've had. So, you know, again, that really just speaks to a lot of the efficiencies of the uh, chicken community. And our value of chickens has also produced or has also increased as well too. When uh, folks in the United States are eating nearly 100 pounds of chicken per year, um, again, that, that's really an important piece and that number continues to increase every year. That's an important piece to the value of the chickens that are produced um, and the, the marketplace as well too. So again, you can see those numbers have continued uh, to rise over the years. What has also rise, uh, uh, risen is our feed cost. So again, this talks to our third leg of our three-legged stool. And Jerry mentioned it, a lot of the, the crop fields that you see along the Nanticoke watershed area um, are producing the corn and soybeans that are going to be fed to the chickens. So um, our companies continue to purchase um, pretty much every, every piece of corn and every, every bit of soybeans they can locally. And then we're also still bringing in corn from outside of the area as well too. So chickens really are as local as it gets. They are locally raised, locally fed, locally processed, locally sold. It, it really is a, a full circle uh, in a lot of ways here in Delmarva. You can see as well too that the numbers of employees um, have uh, increased. I will say there's a little bit of a, um, a jump there that's not quite as accurate. We did have one company that um, had not been including their agribusiness side. So again, that's sort of the, the grain and feed side of business. And they started reporting those numbers a couple of years ago. So the numbers aren't quite as dramatic a jump as you see there, but again, you know, we're, we're employing uh, bet anywhere between 18 and, and 20,000 employees directly by the companies. Um, so those are people, those are jobs, those are good paying jobs. Uh, they are really, again, the backbone of our Dalmarva and uh, the backbone of the folks that are paying taxes and, and living in our area. 
And our payment to our chicken growers have also gone up. So um, as most folks, if you're not aware, so again, our, our family farmers raise the chickens and they contract with the chicken companies. So the chicken companies are paying these uh, growers based off of their contracts. And again, as you can see, that dollar amount has increased over the years. So again, this is, this is a great business. This is a great opportunity for family farmers to uh, live on the farm, to raise a family on the farm, to be at home and still make a very good uh, wage and living for their family as well too. So I've talked a lot about the economics, but I, I would be remiss in not also talking about some of the good things that have occurred on the environmental side as well too within our chicken community. So these numbers and statistics that you see here are nationwide numbers. This is from the National Chicken Council. And you know, right now compared to 1965, it, is, it takes 39% less fossil fuel to produce the same amount of chicken as what we were doing so many years ago. So again, you know, one of the things that we strive for throughout our entire chicken community um, is, is sustainability. And we certainly are trying to meet those marks. It takes 58% less water to produce that same amount of chicken. So again, think about those chicken farms back in 1965 that were utilizing the, the Nanticoke watershed uh, area there and the water that Jerry Kaufman had spoke on, um, we're actually using less than what uh, we use for chicken. And we're also doing, um, you, we're raising more chickens with less farmland. And uh, really what that comes down to is again, I talk about efficiency and nutrition. It takes less feed to raise the same amount of pounds as it did even 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And all of that, again, equates to uh, less uh, or more sustainability, uh, less uh, requirements, again, on fossil fuels and on uh, water as well, too. Another big thing that we've uh, worked on and we do a lot here on Delmarva and we've partnered up with the Nanticoke Watershed Alliance as well is our vegetative buffers around our chicken houses. So we planted uh, this year, uh, even during COVID, we were, managed to plant around 6,000 uh, trees or, or grasses around the farms. And that's really important. Those buffers are not only uh, beneficial in capturing any um, dust or particulates that may come out of the chicken houses, but they're also important for water quality purposes as well, too. I think, as you know, Jerry said, the more trees that we plant, the, the better we are for our climate overall. And so this is just one more way that, you know, our chicken community is trying to do that um, and trying to, uh, again, be more sustainable, be uh, environmentally aware, and be good neighbors as well, too. We also have worked a lot with pollinators. So I think it was mentioned, too, the importance of pollinators. We have done a number of pollinator plantings and buffer on farms, again, working with the Nanticoke Watershed Alliance. I know we've partnered up with a couple farms where we are uh, experimenting with different pollinator plots in between houses as well too. And again, this is a win-win. Um, so it's great for the environment. It's great for other farmers that are producing crops that require pollinators. And it's also good for the chicken farm really just doesn't want to spend that much time mowing grass. And there is a lot of area, a lot of, of grass in the area on those farms that um, you know, they don't want to spend that time doing. So if we can, you know, plant, plant other plants or grasses that are going to be beneficial all the way around, as well as decrease the amount of work that the grower is doing, it works out perfectly. As I mentioned, um, we've been tracking this. So we had at the Marva Chicken Association, we have a vegetative environmental buffer person on staff. Uh, this is very unique. I don't think any other state program or, or association like ours has that. Um, and these are just estimates of, you know, the amount of grasses and trees that we have planted over the years. Um, with some of the, the peaks occurring in 2012 when there was more cost share uh, funds that were really available. Um, but again, you can see, you know, we're planting anywhere between 4,000 to uh, six, 7,000 plants, trees, shrubs, grasses um, on chicken farms throughout Delmarva. 
And it's hard to have a, uh, a talk about chicken without talking about chicken litter. So again, um, I think one of the interesting things that many people uh, may not realize, and there was a good article in the Delaware Business uh, Times today about the fact that you know, chicken litter is not a waste. Chicken litter is a fertilizer. Um, it's an organic fertilizer and it's often used, 95% of it is used right back onto the fields that are able to use it, that are able to take nutrients uh, that are needed based off of the nutrient management plans and are used to grow the corn and soybeans that again are feeding our chicken industry. So, you know, it's again that sort of that continuous loop of, um, of, of sustainability that really works well for our chicken community overall. So with that, I will stop there and I'm happy to answer any questions that might be out there. Sorry, we have a couple um, on the chat that I'll run through. So we have, let's see. Oh, the first one was um, if the quantities were adjusted for, um, sorry, I'm trying to scroll. Oh, sorry. One of them is, is there a cost share for the buffers? There are cost share programs um, for buffers. Um, we work a lot with NRCS. Uh, there are state cost share programs. And then we work a lot too to try to get um, e even working with individual groups. Again, you know, the Nanico Watershed Alliance, we're partnering on doing what I say are probably more research uh, at this point in time. Uh, the state of Delaware uh, through DENREC has some cost share funds. Some of it is targeted towards the Chesapeake Bay. Some of it is targeted towards our inland bays as well too. So there are cost share programs out there um, to help uh, encourage uh, for the, the buffer programs. I'll do a quick plug. Uh, the Nanticoke Watershed Alliance has been partnering with Holly and the Restoration Person Gym. And we've, we've planted two farms each that had about five to seven houses and the swale areas in between those houses. Um, and then we're actually have, we got awarded funding to do three more farms, each with several houses. And I know you guys have done a ton in the past. And then we're actually gonna be doing a tour of some of those farms probably in the fall. Um, with some outreach materials and some information so farmers can see, you know, and talk to another farmer and get a first hand of what it entails and the maintenance and that type of thing. So keep an eye out everyone for those workshops. The next question is, are the Delmarva Chicken Association dollar values cited adjusted for inflation? Several of them are, I have to go back and look. And we actually have on our website, if you visit um, uh, dcachicken.com, uh, we have a fact sheet out on our website where we do adjust uh, those numbers based off of inflation as well too, yes. Someone else asked, um, seems like the roofs of houses would be a good opportunity for solar panels. Is this common and are there incentives for that? So, so that's a great question um, and it's been come up. So it really, it depends. So in some ways, when you look at those roofs, you would say, okay, that makes sense. But it all depends on how the, uh, the chicken house was, was built um, as to whether or not it can sustain the weight of, um, of the solar panels, as well as then you add on snow or ice that we're getting now too. So traditionally chicken houses have not been built with that in mind. Um, but I do believe over the past few years, we've had a number of growers where that has been an interest. Now we do have a number of farms where they are putting, um, again, they are putting solar panels onto the chicken houses because one of the number one expenses of a grower is electricity. So anything they can do to reduce that cost is a benefit. Um, however, as everyone knows, there's also expenses that come along with uh, solar as well too. So in some areas, in some states, there have been some programs that have helped with it. Um, I think even NRCS has some programs that they've helped with it. Um, but again, as you drive around, you'll see some of the, the panels that are on houses, but you'll also see many where they will actually have them in the ground. And a lot of that also too comes, uh, depends on the a solar company that you're working with. I've, ha I've had conversations with some solar companies that would prefer it to be on the houses and some that would prefer it to be on the ground. Um, so, but we do have a number of growers who are looking at, uh, at that as a good um, investment. A lot of it really just comes down to um, sort of where it falls into the, the uh, uh, 
basically the cash flow. You know, if they have the ability where it can cash flow because they do know eventually there will be a return on investment, no doubt, when you decrease your electric costs. It's just a matter of the upfront costs that, that come along with it. And I've seen a lot of uh, the arrays and fields right next to the chicken houses are starting to pop up. And, and a lot of them are even starting to switch those over to pollinator meadows under the fields as well. So full circle. Um, and then this is from, oh, hold on, we have one more, um, a bit off topic, but from what I've heard, this is from Ellen Kohler, um, internet service will be a great economic investment for farmers in the Delmarva. Do you know if that is a problem? I live in Cambridge and I would say yes, but Holly, do you have some input? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so much of what we do, so many of the advancements, so many reasons why you see, you know, farms that have four or five uh, chicken houses on them versus maybe just two is, is technological advancements. Um, the technology that's out there that allows a, a farmer or grower to be able to use their cell phone even to get readings, constant readings as to temperature, fans, anything going on inside those houses. All of those require either good Wi-Fi, good cell phone signal, all of those same issues um, that many of us are facing right now with COVID when it comes to, you know, that rural broadband. So uh, it's, it's absolutely important to have more of that internet services throughout our rural areas um, because so much of what farmers do is, is technology driven. It's, I mean, it's completely different than where it was you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. I often say when my father is using the computer more than a little, that's saying something. And, and he's been farming for quite a while. So it's absolutely important. Great, Zach, was that you that had a question? Okay. Maybe. Sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't find my mute. No, it was. It was about. It was just about solar. I was going to say to your comment why you see the arrays in the fields oftentimes is when the solar company comes and uh, evaluates the location for solar. They're looking for optimal angle and optimal uh, positioning for the panel. Otherwise, the panels actually aren't economically viable, meaning they won't produce enough energy to offset the cost of incurring that infrastructure improvement. So that's why you see the arrays oftentimes in the field right next to the houses, because they're on a slightly different angle um, that allows them to, you know, produce as much renewable energy as possible. And to your point, now they're using that that area underneath of it as um, a location for native pollinators and, and other plants. So it was just an addition to Holly's comments. Great. Thank you, Zach. Do we have any other questions before we move on to the next speaker? See one in there that was asking about state and federal subsidies for chicken farmers. So there really are not um, state and federal subsidies like you would think about maybe with other parts of agriculture when it comes to chicken growers. So again, we talked about there's cost share programs. Um, NRCS has a number of cost share programs that are out there. Uh, the state of Delaware has um, some cost share programs specific to resource concerns, um, specific to uh, manure storage or composting. Um, but I would not say that there are, are necessarily the same types of uh, you know, subsidies per se uh, with chicken, chicken farmers and chicken growers um, out there now. Um, and as a matter of fact, again, you know, the most expensive part of uh, being a, a chicken farmer is number one, buying the land and building the chicken houses, of course, the USDA programs, uh, working with other lenders as well, too. Um, but, you know, number two, again, is the electricity, uh, the electricity piece. And again, there are programs, there's, uh, you know, there's cost share, there's um, solar, there's other things that can be done, but it's not necessarily subsidized by any point. We do have an additional question from Yul Lee. Is there, if there is a lengthy power outage in Delmarva, like in Texas, will the poultry growers be prepared? Absolutely, they, they will be. And I, I will say, I follow a lot of, of different sites where we're seeing, um, I, my heart goes out to those in Texas, Mississippi, which again are very strong um, chicken states out there because this, this is not what they're used to. But every chicken farm out there has a backup uh, propane system uh, that's in place. Um, and so, and, and they test those often. 
to make sure that we don't have those power outages. But yeah, every chicken farm is as prepared as can be with having a lot of backups um, in place and testing in place. Um, and uh, you know, again, our, our hearts go out to those uh, out in the in some of the states who are just not quite prepared for the weather um, as we are. But uh, that is a big part when they are building. When we're building chicken farms, there's always a backup power uh, source. Great. Uh, ben Coverdale from Denrec mentioned that the non-point source Section 319 grants um, are also a good funding source for poultry growers um, when they're talking about doing buffers um, as well. And then I think I've captured all the comments. Um, if, hey, if Lisa, I... it's, it's Kenny. I'm just going to jump in real quick on the state federal subsidy to add a little bit. Uh, typically, poultry growers have been left out of that equation because they don't own the birds. The poultry company owns the birds. So even programs like, quote unquote, crop insurance, poultry growers haven't been eligible for uh, because of that ownership thing. But uh, just recently, at the end of the year, USDA did find a way to include in some of the um, CFAP money uh, for coronavirus emergency assistance uh, some money that's that's going to come out for poultry growers to help them with some of the um, impact that they've uh, suffered from coronavirus. So there will be some federal money coming. Uh, Holly and others uh, on the call, um, Kurt, myself, have been working with USDA to come up with a formula that's fair to try to adjust for the timing of the flocks one year to next, et cetera, et cetera. But there will be there will be some money coming for that and. Last year, Maryland and Delaware cooperated. We wanted to have the same program for, for all growers on, on Delmarva. We didn't have want, to, want to have a Delaware program and a Maryland program. So we sent out just a little bit of money. It wasn't nearly enough to make people whole, but it was appreciated. And uh, you know that was for coronavirus assistance also. So I'll just say to, uh, to the folks, stay tuned. There is a little bit of assistance coming from USDA. Great, thank you. Kenny is with the uh, Delaware Department of Ag, so he's been a great resource uh, for me personally as well, learning about some of these things. So thank you, Kenny. Any other questions? No, uh, no uh, Lisa, just a light question, Holly. It's a great presentation. I didn't realize the habitat value of the chicken houses with the, uh, uh, the buffers in the forest. It's really good to hear about that. Uh, but who has the best chicken sandwich? I know that probably can't get answered. I'd like I like a roll of farms or uh, Popeyes, but that's a big debate. That, that is a big that debate. And that's actually been a great thing. That's that's probably, I actually just read an article this morning in a trade pub that, you know, it's those chicken sandwich wars that may be really helping to potentially drive those prices back up a little bit uh, after COVID. So uh, I, I'll let I'll let there be a poll. Maybe I'll add that to uh, future presentations as a poll yeah. on that one. <laughs> no, it's very, very important these days where you can do takeout. I don't know about people, but um, I know animal control uses Royal Farms when they're trying to catch a stray dog. <laughs> so <laughs> I learned that the hard way, unfortunately, I had a foster dog get loose. But um, so if it if you want to know the canine vote, that's Emily, that's the canine vote. <laughs> but uh, back back to work talk. <laughs> um, so the next speaker is actually uh, Pete Edinger. Um, he is with Bioenergy Debco, which is, if you're familiar, if you've seen the articles about um, Seaford had a camp composting site that was Purdue's property that was uh, recently sold, and they're actually handling the composting, and they're also going to be um, setting up a facility for anaerobic digestion, which is, um, I'll hand it over to Pete. He can explain all that to you, what that means. Sure. Are, you, are you there, Pete? You ready to take I am over? here. I am here. Right. I'm... Thank you. Share my, well, wait a second. There we go. That should work. There's a presentation, but uh, I wanted to thank everybody to, uh, for the opportunity. It's a, it, it's a great and really a cherished opportunity to be part of this community. I was joking ahead of time with our uh, fellow panelists that when, uh, you know, my background is, is in Silver Spring and that part in Annapolis and I think uh, the nicest part about crossing the river is, is and cr going over the bridge is I can feel my blood pressure go down and I can feel my smile start because it's never a, a bad place or as illustrated by the panel members, you know, there are very few places that combine uh, not only business, but with the environment and the ability to be in an area that is 
so strikingly beautiful and and, and so vi vibrantly ri rich with opportunity. Uh, I think that's the interesting aspect of how we, over the course of time, have balanced the, the poultry industry and the, the contributions the poultry industry has made with a burgeoning environmental movement to say, look, these two things need to work together. And it's very important to work together, uh, not only for the economy, uh, not only for business, but really to ensure that the environment stays uh, not only uh, safe, but pure. Um, let's see, which one? Sorry, my thing, there we go. Sorry, trying to move my little slideshow around and not seeming, it's seeming to have frozen. Uh, hold on a moment, I apologize. I'm just a troglodyte when it comes to these things. There we go. Um, I, I think that this is best said for us uh, over at um, Bioenergy Devco was a quote by the former governor uh, where talking about uh, choosing between us a strong economy uh, and a strong poultry industry and a clean and strong environment. And his answer was, listen, I'll take both. And we believe in that very, very much. That's the premise of what anaerobic digestion is all about, that we believe strongly that as a, a company entering a facility or entering a, a Delaware uh, that has had a long history and trying to achieve certain sustainability goals. One of the reasons we're so proud to be part of uh, the Seaford facility is that it, it is, there's, there's been a long history there in terms of not only creating great fertilizer, uh, but being able to manage poultry waste from litter to DAF, you know, and no matter how you qualify it or describe it, it's been a wide variety of materials that have had, had a great deal of controversy over a period of time. And as Holly mentioned, you know, litter um, and DAF is a, a has a tremendous amount of nutrients so how do we manage that in such a way that we're also then not contributing to the detriment of the Anacoke or contributing to the Chesapeake uh, uh, challenges of the Chesapeake watershed? You know, our, our folks on the call have already spoken a lot of the, about the contributions. Uh, and it's illustrative, this slide for me at least, is illustrative of, of why these two industries or why these two groups need to work together. Uh, and why a careful balance is key to, to any company entering this part of the world. And that is, is a, a key part of what we do in the world of anaerobic digestion. So a little bit of shameless plug about who we are. Uh, Bioenergy Devco through its BTS technology company has been around for 22 years. We built 230 of these plants throughout, throughout the world. We operate 150. Um, we inject uh, renewable natural gas, non-fossil fuel, renewable natural gas created through the natural, a natural fermentation uh, uh, process to four, actually it's now four international grids, uh, contributing not only to the growth of compressed natural gas and vehicles, uh, but also to the production of hydrogen. So the interesting part for us is we're able to guarantee and ensure performance of these plants based on our understanding of what's known as co-digestion and microbiology and the ability to go and, and carefully orchestrate what we refer to as the right spices for the right soup. Anybody can be a chef, anybody can throw stuff in a crock pot, but when you add the right spices, it truly is a dish. And that's what we believe is a point of difference. There's been a lot of discussion, by the way, as we know about anaerobic digestion, not only in, in farms, but around the world. And there've been some bad actors, not bad actors is probably not the right way to, 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 to discuss it, but. Uh, it's been an industry here in the United States that started out with small farm digesters, trying to pull people off the grid. You know, the challenge with that is when you're a farmer, you know, and you're now trying to operate a, a digester, which is a complex piece of machinery, you now have to decide, are you going to be a great farmer or are you going to be a great electric person? Uh, and most people say, I want to be a great farmer. There have also been a lot of people who've come around this process and said, well, uh, had made large promises and said, well, if you uh, provide me with materials, uh, I'll be able to go finance that and I'll go be able to then uh, build my anaerobic digester. And they, they've done that without history, uh, without a, a, a safety record uh, and without a performance record. We're very lucky to have it had a 22 year plus history and we're very lucky to have been self-financed so that we're not sitting out here uh, looking at the government to kind of provide a series of incentives 
to be able to manage a challenge that has long been on the Delmarva. Uh, you know, certainly we're always fond of saying that we'll take anybody's check and would be happy to work with people to go make that happen. But we chose this part of the world because we think we fill a fill an important need. Simply, uh, we think we believe, of course, we believe, you know, uh, that ADs provide a, a balance between uh, economical and smart and environmentally savvy ways to land at, change the world of land application, uh, overcrowded landfill use, and, and in many places, you know, non Delmarva based, you know, pollution causing incineration. And I look at that, particularly in the chicken industry or the poultry industry, particularly because there has been such great controversy around litter, which is now seen as a co commodity, or more importantly, DAF waste, the dissolved air flotation waste that comes from the processing uh, fields, uh, processing um, uh, chicken processing, uh, which also is very, very high in nutrients, but has many more restrictions in land application, many more uh, issues associated with smell, many more issues associated with simply storing that material. So what we're doing now is driving trucks far, far beyond the Delmarva to areas that potentially are allowed, where this is now allowed, but where those opportunities are now being restricted little by little. So our thought is how do you trans, you know, it's the concept of reuse, re recycle and repurpose. So how do we take these types of materials and really transform them, really make them a, a productive part of the economy and allow communities and others to balance zero waste, the idea of how do we remove waste with sustainable agriculture and, and decarbonization goals. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, what anaerobic digestion is, um, the best way to think about it is a cow stomach on an industrialized scale. It is at four chambers, the rumen, you know, the, the, the aspects of a cow who are, is able to digest in four separate chambers within their stomach. Uh, we do the same thing. A cow eats, eats grass. You know, for us, we take in organic materials. Now, here we'll be very focused only on the poultry industry, but in our Maryland Food Center Authority facility or our, our facility down in uh, Georgia, we can take all sorts of separated organics, you know, packaged foods, uh, processing materials, all sorts of, of things, as long as it's organic. We put this in through an anaerobic digestion facility that is in fact completely enclosed. So if you think about a, a, a kind of facility where you dump materials on the ground and it would be exposed to air, this is very different. A truck drives into an enclosure, a high speed door shuts behind it, and then everything is then self-contained. When we create two products, we create renewable energy of all sorts. It can be electricity, it can be renewable natural gas, it can even be green hydrogen. And we have a number of uses for that. We're very fortunate actually to be uh, teaming here in, on the Delmarva with Chesapeake Utilities, who has made a commitment to take that renewable natural gas and take out or reduce the amount of fracked gas that they're in fact using or distributing. I think the more really the cool part, and I'm a soil person from way from way back, having had an experimental farm at one point uh, over in Queen Anne's, where we were trying to uh, deal with uh, thermophilic composting and trying to transition uh, the phosphor the phosphorus so that it would become plant available. Uh, we the digestate that comes out of this process, uh, at the anaerobic digestion process, is in fact a, a transformed product that can be land applied. Now we're not suggesting that directly, but I will tell you that that happens throughout Europe. And in fact, in the state of Maryland as an example, uh, they allow direct land application after drying uh, for uh, soil reclamation, uh, for the use in stormwater management and along state highways. For us though, we'll be taking that material, drying it, and then also including it with an existing compost facility that we have on site. So what I've been talking about, the site in Seaford, Delaware, is the old Purdue recycling facility. So it was originally permitted to take in 120,000 plus tons of chicken litter um, and, and, and transform that into a pelletized um, uh, fertilizer. Uh, since uh, during uh, our conversations with Purdue, Purdue said, look, we do, um, we do chickens really well. We're not sure we do sustainability well, We'd like a partner. We'd like to be able to work with somebody. So what we've agreed to is that we would purchase the facility from them, which includes this major green uh, building, which you'll see in a minute, and a compost facility, because we our feeling is that this is an integrated uh, uh, process 
that allows easy and smart and effective disposal of materials typically uh, set, uh, set for land application and where we'll have the ability to transform that in a, in a single within a single entity. We'll produce a bunch of gas from that. Uh, it'll be 410,000 MMBTUs, which just simply means, and I'm way over my skis when I talk about this stuff, is it's about 12 to 15% of what Chesapeake will have currently operates in within their process. This is an early rendering uh, of the facility. As you see in the, the southwestern part is the entrance to the, um, I'm just, it's always fun in Zoom, you're trying to point to a picture and you realize nobody else can see what you're doing. But you you can see this in south, uh, it really on the southwest side, you see an entrance. It's the current entrance. And this is what you would see from an aerial view or from the, uh, from the roadway. And the facility in the front is with the old is the old recycling facility, the old pelletizing facility, and you see in the back uh, a configuration of completely enclosed digester tanks. Trucks now would go as you look in the little white space on the left. Uh, those are truck scales. You're weighed. Uh, once you're weighed, you make a little bit of a circle. You come into that building. Uh, that door shuts. Uh, negative. It is enclosed by negative pressure. Uh, you unleash your load, so it either goes into an enclosed trough or it goes, if it's liquid in its orientation, it is uh, sent by pump. And then the pumps go to each of these uh, towers that you see or tanks that you see, and they include a combination of retention, retention facilities, meaning we can hold a certain amount of material, and then these fermentation facilities. And again, this is a completely natural process. We use microbials. There is no burning. There is uh, no incineration. Uh, there's nothing else associated with that. When it's completed, you see in the far north or far, uh, uh, the compost facility, that is an operating facility permitted via DENREC, uh, which is allowed to currently take in 30,000 tons of, of uh, what we refer to as litter uh, broadly, but is, includes a combination of DAF waste, hatchery waste, actual manure, um, although we use very, very little of that in this process. And it's combined, uh, the digestate would go to that facility, would be combined with a carbon source, wood, and then go through the, car, the, the compost process. We have a number of people who we sell to currently, and this most uh, predominant amount of this material, probably about 60%, I think, uh, goes off the Delmarva. So it's sold to Scots, Coast of Maine, Grizzlies, and they combine this material in some of their best selling organic uh, products. Uh, we're here for 30 years, minimally. So when we make a decision to invest in a community, and it is an investment, uh, we are part of that community for the next 30 years plus. So our goal is to how do we increase the capacity of a landfill? How do we reduce land application? And how do we ensure that water quality is preserved? Odors are managed because we are completely enclosed and anything that could uh, produce an odor is either in a seal, sealed tank or we use scrubbers and bioreactors to make sure that those odors are captured. We do that, by the way, we're currently permitted to do that at the compost facility and we'll do the same thing within this facility as well and stay well within any permits that are we're fortunate enough to get through DENREC. And I would say we're about ready to offer our permits uh, on what's known as a resource recovery permit uh, to the folks at DENREC, and we hope that they'll look at that in a favorable light. Transport costs uh, are completely uh, reduced because no longer are you going up 13A or 13 and going all the way from Accomack, Virginia, call it, or down in Virginia, going through our communities and then going to Philadelphia or other areas and going off the Delmarva. The predominant amount of materials that we will receive will be within a 30 mile uh, radius, primarily from, the Del from uh, Delaware, we do take already some materials from Salisbury through the Purdue facility. And I would say that Purdue uh, it was excited enough about this in terms of their sustainability goals to sign an agreement with us to provide uh, material, um, excess organics for 20 years. Uh, so they have made a commitment to, uh, to the facility and to the, the, process, the anaerobic digestion process, believing that it has continued uh, benefits to the area. We reduce greenhouse gases, I'll touch on that in a minute, uh, and we reduce pathogens and antibiotic uh, activities in, within the digested organics because they go through a, a PFRP process. I would also mention that we create jobs. 
Uh, our job will have 30, we currently uh, employ 11 people. I think it's about to become 12 if we're lucky and if they accept it today. Our, we'll hire another 30 plus within our facility, within the anaerobic digestion facility. There's a sign before you get to our place uh, by, uh, of Amex offering $13.75 as a starting wage. Our starting wage is $15 for operators and ranges to $27 plus dollars as well as a number of salaried positions that are in the research field, uh, that are in the testing field, and that are in the administrative and management field as well. Um, we'd also wanna, before I get into, well, uh, carbon, and uh, again, forgive me that it's, it's a Central Park reference. Um, we have to do that for the Delmarva, uh, for sure, or for Seaford, more importantly, or for Delaware, more importantly. Uh, but a typical uh, facility, an AD facility that takes in around 120,000 tons, I'm sorry, about 220,000 tons of material, uh, reduces carbon uh, to the point that it's 56 times the size of Central Park. So this is enough, enough uh, reduction to power seven or 8,000 uh, homes and an equivalent amount of cars. So the impact we have, because we are carbon negative, uh, in, in how the U.S. Uh, government and how their sciences, science, our um, professors look at this, is that we ring the bell in terms of various companies, ESG requirements, uh, in terms of relocation and being interested in actually participating in the, the Delmarva economy. People are not looking only for renewable natural gas and a clean source of energy, but they want to know that they have managed the economic or the environmental impact in terms of carbon sequestration. I should mention one other thing about the, the community um, is that we already have been doing this kind of activity. We're having discovery days. We will continue to do that. We invite everybody here to come on out in a socially responsible uh, way. Lisa, you were kind enough to come and, and do a tour at one point. Uh, we've invited a number of folks, whether we do this online or whether we do this um, in person, we'd love to do tours. Which, uh, you know, for years, people actually, when we went to the community near us uh, that is in a, um, a mobile uh, mobile home uh, facility, they said, well, it's great to meet you. We thought that you guys were producing dog food back there. Uh, we didn't really know much about it. We didn't understand what was there. And we've invited people from that community and all of our neighbors to, to come and see what we're doing. We're very lucky to be working with Dell Tech in terms of jobs. We're working with University of Delaware in terms of research and ter uh, the effects of Digeste. Uh, we're teaching a class um, at Sussex Tech to uh, up. We've donated compost to, the, to CASA and various other organizations as well. Three, three key points um, that folks will have for sure and we are always are concerning is soils. What do we do for soil health? Well, two things that we do in the, in the process is that simply we can manage phosphorus and we can manage nitrogen uh, as tagged onto the process. So we can strip that and use that nutrient in other areas and in fact pr uh, provide it uh, in communities that are actually um, phosphorus de de deficient. The product that we do sell actually when it goes to a Scots or others is you know, has an NPK that is valuable for their clients. And clearly they would not be selling a high phosphorus uh, product here on the Delmarva, um, or if they did, they would probably be out of business a lot faster than anybody could actually think. Um, healthier air, it's important for us and we meet all, all of our facilities in, in our past experience have met all European Union uh, requirements, which frankly are much more stringent than they are, are here in the United States. We're, we are below anything re restricted by the EPA and in fact, as I've said, that we enclose all of our, our facility, it's minimized uh, air, air exposure, if not no air exposure. And if there was, it would all be in through a scrubber and we would all manage it through a bioreactor. And water is also key. There are a lot, there's lots of challenges on how much water we use in this process. Um, actually, we use practically nothing. We recycle all of our water and we recycle our digest date sludge. And why is that? Because much unlike a, a digester that would take 100%, and again, 100% of chicken manure, uh, which is very, very dry, we are taking a variety of materials that are very liquid. So DAF waste, for example, comes under 12% liquid. In fact, I think a recent load was distributed at three or 5%. So the balance between what we do with our scientists between dry load and, and liquid load 
allows us minimal, minimal use of water, if any, in terms of our own water wells that are sitting on the facility itself. We also are, are building a uh, wastewater treatment facility on site uh, where we will take that water, treat that water to meet Seaford, uh, Seaford and Sussex County standards. Initially, what we'll be doing is we'll be trucking that uh, to one of their facilities. But our goal within the next two years, or within we hope sooner than that, is to work with Sussex County to do a sewer uh, connection uh, to that, to um, so we do, can actually take trucks over, off the road. And if we do have trucks on the road, you know, my my goal, and at least the way I've been trying to push people, is to make sure uh, they're all filled with compressed natural gas. Uh, digestate, we've talked about, it looks like a pellet you would have gotten from Purdue a number of years ago. It can be uh, put in a super sack if it was for agricultural use, but we primarily sell it by bulk. We put it in trucks uh, and uh, the, our clients take them to their own manufacturing and formulation facilities. We produce that product now, we'll add digestate to it. Uh, we believe, and we've seen throughout Europe, that it does a couple of amazing things. Actually, if you use it as cow uh, bedding, it reduces mastitis. We're now working with Purdue and with a few others talking about making it into poultry uh, bedding to see if there's a more efficient way because it's now filled with microbes, efficient way to deal, uh, reduce antibiotic use or be able to provide a more odorless uh, uh, cleaning, cleaning option. But there are a number of places in which this product is used. It's also important to say that in Europe, uh, methane, uh, uh, it's the only continent that shows reduction in methane. Um, and that's a key key piece. And they've made a tremendous amount of commitments to the bio, bio uh, energy or an anaerobic process and the use of CNG. Uh, our goals uh, really have, I, you know, I, as summary, you know, it's, I wanna be able to use, or we wanna be able to use a nature's process, a natural process, to address the issues of and challenges of organic residuals. We wanna ensure our roles as environmental stewards. It makes, it makes sense for us. Again, think of it, we're financed, so we make an investment. We bought the facility. We're gonna be in a community for a long period of time. If we don't work smartly with the poultry industry, cities, towns, and environmental community, that would be a serious mistake on any company's, company's books. And in fact, we see more and more companies who are making a very important effort uh, to try to work within these communities in a productive and, 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 and uh, important way. Uh, renewable energy is clearly key. It is an economic driver. Uh, people come to uh, local areas that ha can provide that kind of important product. Uh, our distribution methods through CUC will be simple and will be trucked to a, what's called an interconnection point. And that trucking will be minimized to two to three trucks per day, but it's not anything different than you would see uh, on the in the road today. It'd be either propane delivered by Sharps or any of these other organizations, it will not um, uh, you know be any different in that sense. Uh, we hope to to continue our market in the digestate uh, world. We hope and we think that we will little by little through our work with Carvel School and a number of others be able to show uh, show the community that there is incre incredible value here. So not only is chicken litter have value, but we hope to, to, to multiply that, that, that import by the use of digestate as well. And clearly the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, it's key to any community and key to where we live and key to our climate, uh, climate uh, now into the future. So our basic theme, you know, what's good, good for the environment, uh, should be and must be good for business. And we're looking forward to be a, a great member of the Delaware community. So thank you, thank you all very much. You're on mute, Lisa. Of course, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> Had to do that at some point, right? Um, we actually have a couple questions in the chat that I'll start with and then we'll sure. go out to the group. Um, let's see. We had a bunch of questions. Oh, Andrew Holmes, you said the Royal Farms chicken is overrated, but that was from our last time. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, Kathy McGrath. Um, sorry, I'm having problems with my chat box. Do you want me to go through mine? Can you read yours? Yeah, sure. Okay. I can do that. Um, 
Peter, what is a Nutricon that digested them after the process? Organic materials such as this are excellent for crop production, uh, retention. Uh, when I'm sorry, I should be actually reading. I'm, re I'm reading them to myself. <laughs> um, uh, the first question is what's the nutrient content of the digested material after the process? Um, organic materials such as the, this are excellent for crop production. On this sandy soil, increase nutrient retention by increasing soil um, uh, oh, uh, matter when used appropriate and a nutrient management plan can be valuable. So nutrient content is based on the material that we bring in. So if that material was heavy in phosphorus, nitrogen, or, or uh, potassium, it would come out as being, being uh, very uh, strong in that area. We though have a huge amount of organics there uh, and we can regulate the amount of NPK that we add to this. So we believe, and in Europe, it is, as I mentioned, land applied directly. And I can give you a number of studies and we'll share uh, that an increase in crop production and most importantly, dealing with uh, soil decompa decompaction. You know, an issue here of, of traditional fertilizers has always been compacted soils and how do we manage that? And certainly sandy soil. The nice part about when you use this, you know, in uh, golf courses, for example, and you use that as a top layer, you, and using sand as a drainage, you're now seeing roots go through the sand. And it's kind of an interest, interesting challenge. I saw an experiment here that was used in a turf farmer and that person's challenge to us was, this is too good. This digestate is actually helping me grow really, really strongly and I'm having a, a tough uh, challenge. Um, does the compost digestate have an odor and will the amount of that material in the open air increase? The answer is no and no. Um, we control the odor, any of the odors in the digestion process. And as our scientists are fond of saying, we cook the stink out of it. Um, it is uh, nothing different than you would see our smell going past a farm. Um, and in fact, I would tell you that you can come, even, in fact, even to our compost facility and many, most days, you'll probably smell the chicken uh, farmer next door before you'll actually smell anything that we're, we're doing. Um, Maria uh, Pyan mentioned that it was its benefit family farmers. How much litter will you be taking in and why create energy of litter as a valuable resource needed? Uh, well, as we uh, talked about uh, before, our primary source is DAF waste, processing waste, uh, which needs a home and needs a valuable home. DAF waste does have a significant odor and there have been land restriction, uh, land application restrictions, even uh, restrictions in storage. So predominant amount of our materials will come from DAF. We will take some litter, um, whether that is through a, 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 a larger farmer or whether it'll be through friends of ours like Ray Ellis, you know, who's been on the shore for you know, no, any number of years transporting litter. Uh, we'll be able to manage that process based on what we believe our energy production should and could be and providing, we hope, an environmental asset. Um, uh, how much of your production inputs will cover the Sussex County poultry waste output? Uh, that's... Okay, I, I can, okay. You're good. I can answer where it goes, um, how, where our compost goes, if that's in any way helpful. No, no, this is an input question. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the inputs come primarily from Sussex County. Um, the, it's, uh, you think of Mount Air, you think of a number of, um, you think of um, Purdue in, 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 in this area. We have some Maryland and uh, there's a possibility we might take something from Accomac, but the inputs are primarily Delaware based and it primarily goes outside of the Delmarva. If I could go on to the, um, whoops, sorry, there's a bunch. Um, right now there are no pellets for sale uh, Judy, but I can tell you if you want to come over to the come over to the facility and see Monica, who's on sc screen, we can get you some compost for sure. Happy to happy to do that. Um, and then Holly Porter had a great question on on um, the three legged stool. Family farmers, chicken companies, and grain farmers are all connected. Supporting supporting one supports them all. You know, we we can't. This is a this. I'm not, we are not discriminatory when it comes to waste or waste when it comes to our, our excess organics. Whether you're a small farmer or whether you're a processor, we want to be in the middle and be able to manage that process. We want to provide people an opportunity to be able to do so in an environmentally way that is supportive of our economy and supportive of the environment. So as long as, as the Delmarva and as long as Delaware has a poultry industry and it has challenges on what to do with that waste and how to manage that in a more effective way, we want to be in, be part of that, that answer. 
Um, and then Dustin Thompson said 12 to 13, uh, I said that this will produce 12 to 13 percent of the demand for natural gas that Chesapeake Utilities requires. So this will offset 12 to 13 percent of the procurement of natural gas. Or will this be in addition to their current procurement to meet future demand? Is that in any in any deal or contract or in writing? I you you would have to ask Chesapeake Utilities how they plan to use the material. I think what they're saying, and this is Peter Ettinger's assumption, not a contractual assumption in any way, shape, or form, is that most utilities, including Chesapeake, want to be able to green their pipeline. They want to be able to re retain a source of renewable natural gas truly non-fracked renewable natural gas, truly organic renewable natural gas uh, from outside sources, replacing uh, the demands of, of what would be a fossil fuel. So how they use that uh, and who they distribute it to uh, is not within my purview, but I do know that that goal and objective is Im important. And then Dustin also said, you had said in a previous presentation that biogas is to be refined and remove contaminants for Chesapeake to take it into their system. Is that happening on site? Please, everybody needs to understand this is not a gas, a gasoline refinery in any way, shape, or form. This fits on the this fits on the footprint, you know, of an existing facility. Gas cleaning is done in a very small skid, and it is done on site. So we do manage that material in an effective and, and, and an environmentally sound, sound way and in a safe way. So this is this is not, you know, there have been some discussions that this is going to be a gas refinery in your backyard. Um, it, it, it is not by any way, shape, or, uh, or form. And then we have a number of other, uh, of other questions by people who, who have been uh, addressing and attacking some of the things that we're doing over the course of time. I'm happy to answer them. Happy to answer them also, Maria, and others on, offline as well. If you'd like to come to a discovery day or be part of that discussion, happy to, happy to do it. I mean, these are questions about permit questions that we have not submitted yet uh, to DENREC. Um, and so we're, you know, uh, once, once those are submitted, I hope everybody takes a look at them. And then actually, you know, we can have a, a, a strong uh, and good dialogue. And Dustin, yes, I'm, your point is right. It's on, it is on site. And I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm sure I got a little uh, uh, sensitive to that because a lot of folks are saying this is going to be a, an oil refinery sitting in the middle of Seaford. We captured most of the comments. I know there was a lot of questions. Um, is anyone on the screen just for the sake of time? Um, does anyone have a quick question on video? Can you hear me, Lisa? Yes. I typed into the chat uh, for Peter. Is that facility um, capable of processing organic chicken waste like blood, guts, and feathers? Yeah, I'm sorry, Fred. I didn't see it. I my apologies. I was probably going too fast. The, an That's the okay. answer is. The answer is yes, you know, but but understand from our perspective, we're very logistics oriented. So we like to know ahead of time what's coming to us. Mm -hmm. So because that requires a, a microbial mix that adjusts for those types of things. But the answer is yes. In, in volume or would it be a small volume if you could take such, a, I, I, you seem to be implying that uh, you would have to know about it. So be specially prepared. Is that what you're saying? No, we typically try to plan that over the course of a of a you know month to two months time, so we know that certain deliveries are there. Certain microbes do better with certain things, so you want to make sure it's like Pepsi. There's 1,400 different kinds of lactobacillus. We just want to make sure the right the right the right microbes are there at the right time. So I'd be I'd ha happy to talk about scheduling and how to make that happen uh, in an effective way. Okay. Happy to introduce anybody on the organic side to our scientists as well. It's really interesting. I did the tour um, and I'm sure it'll be more interesting once the anaerobic parts are set up, but um, it is very helpful to kind of visit the site and get a feel for um, what they're going to be doing there. Any other questions from the video group before we switch over to our next speaker? Well, thank you, Lisa. Thanks very much. And thanks for the questions. Great. Thank you, Peter. Um, so our next presenter is actually Fred Pomeroy who had his question about chicken guts. <laughs> so of course, of course, the waterman wants to know about uh, chicken necks and things. So, um, <laughs> so um, I'm gonna hand over to Fred and he's um, a local waterman and farmer. And he's actually gonna be talking about the economic impacts of local fishery. Uh, 
but uh, I'm a waterman, uh, uh, lifelong waterman. I've got 56 years experience in Chesapeake Bay commercial fisheries. I told my son, I'm going to, I'm going to figure that business out soon. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk to you today um, about economic issues and environmental issues around the three major fisheries in Maryland. I, I call those uh, Maryland's big three. And of course, of course, most of you know that I'm speaking of the crab fishery, the blue crab fishery, the oyster fishery, and the striped bass fishery. There's other fisheries in Maryland, but those three are by far the biggest. And uh, I've done some research and come up with staggering amount of figures. I'm going to try to keep my figures to a minimum so your eyes don't glaze over any any quicker than they would. Um, I'm wondering, Lisa, if I've sort of got my uh, presentation broken down into three sections, um, of the, the uh, oyster fishery, the crab fishery, and the uh, rockfish or the striped bass fishery. I'm wondering if I could ask for questions at the end of each little section uh, just to uh, so I don't get this uh, feeling of I'm talking only to the screen. If, if, if sure. people could interrupt me, even that would be great for me. Uh, yep, now definitely. What I need to do to go next slide. Down the bottom. Oh, I don't have the, I don't have the, the cursor. The board arrow should work. Oh, yeah. oh, just, uh, you can just Okay, yeah, I've got this quote up now. Hopefully, are you seeing that, Lisa, and the yep. rest of you? Yep. I don't hear any answer. Okay, uh, I took this as a little dedicatory uh, quote, and uh, I found this as uh, as I was uh, beginning to do some research for the presentation. Uh, I think this sort of informs. Uh, my view of how important uh, natural resources and the environment are to the country as a whole. It says the wealth of the nation is in its air, water, soil, forests, minerals, lakes, bays, scenic beauty, wildlife habitats, and biodiversity. That's all there is. That's the whole economy. That's where all the economic activity and jobs come from. These biological systems are the sustaining wealth of the world. That's from someone named Kerry Grisham. Uh, I, I think that that quote sort of encompasses how everything is related to everything else. And when you're talking about uh, the American economy and the economy of the uh, Nanakote watershed, you're talking about something that's based on natural resources and natural systems. Now I'm going to go to my next slide. How do I do that? Can you jump to the next one for me? Because this thing's not hooked up. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, back to Maryland's big three commercial fisheries. I'm starting with oystering. Why do I start there? Well, until the mid 20th century, oystering was the largest fishery on Chesapeake Bay. Um, you all have heard the uh, stories about the whole city of Crisfield uh, is built on oyster shells. And a uh, hundred years ago, uh, a train car load of shucked oysters went out of Crisfield every day and, and maybe even more in the 19th century. They say that the folks that uh, worked on the Transcontinental Railroad ate canned oysters that came from Tangier Sound. Uh, which is just below us here on the Nanakoke. Uh, and you also hear from environmental groups, uh, some of which I belong to, that uh, we need to go back to the glory days, back when the oysters uh, were being harvested at a rate of 10 to 15, 15 million bushels a year. Uh, the fact is that that level of, of fishing effort uh, 100 to 150 years ago was not sustainable. Uh, that was due to boats from New England, dredge boats coming down into the Chesapeake and basically overrunning the Chesapeake because the demand for oysters was so high 
uh, the the, uh, the oyster appetite in Europe and in England was starved by the fact that Thames was polluted and there were no there were no oysters there anymore. So they took the Chesapeake oysters at an unsustainable rate, and eventually that led to a uh, big decline in the oyster fishery and regulations became involved. And by the, I'm gonna say 1910 to 1920, uh, the Chesapeake oyster involved, evolved into a fishery that was pretty reliably producing about two and a half million bushels of oysters a year. That's in Maryland. Um, and that went on for 30 years. Uh, and then just around 1980, the fishery almost collapsed. It was a drastic decline. That was due to the two diseases that came into the bay, MSX and Dermo. Uh, eventually, after some terrible years in which the fishery basically um, collapsed, there has been some recovery. But the average bushel harvest uh, for the last 30 years uh, averages out, even though there's been a big swing in that, it averages out to about 300,000 bushels per year. So we've uh, just last year before COVID, uh, I'm talking about the 2019-2020 harvest season, uh, Maryland produced 270,000 bushels in the wild fishery. Uh, and that was almost twice as good as the year before. But if you relate to what we had in the 30 years between 50 and 1950 and 1980, you see the fishery net is now about one eighth what it was for many years. And the reason it's that good and that we do have a fishery again is due to significant public and private investment that's happened in oysters over the last 10 years. Uh, the public investments come from uh, the federal government and the state government, uh, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric or, uh, Association, has a multi, multi-million dollar program that's uh, uh, still in progress, restoring uh, oysters in, on a number of sanctuaries around the Bay. And also there's been a lot of uh, private investment through uh, uh, an emphasis, a new emphasis on aquaculture, uh, least bottom. And uh, I myself participate in that. I have uh, about 60 acres of, of bottom leases in Little Chop Tank River. And my goal out of those bottom leases is to try to make it pay for itself and, um, and to leave more oysters in, in the river than I found. Uh, I'm working on that goal. And uh, that's been significantly challenged right now because of COVID. I might get into that a little later. Uh, but oysters generally by scientists are recognized as a keystone species in the Bay, uh, meaning it's a species because it produces its own habitat. And because the oysters filter the water, and they say in a an adult oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day. So they, they got two functions other than uh, providing good food for us to eat and that they're, they're uh, building habitat on the bottom, oyster reefs, which all kinds of other species live on, including crabs, um, including rockfish or striped bass, and including all sorts of uh, small species. And they're filtering the water they're making the water cleaner, which we certainly need because the, uh, the turbidity in the water is one of the big problems we have right now on the Chesapeake. Now, uh, in, in terms of the Nanticoke specifically, I mentioned the uh, sanctuary program that the state instituted, I guess about, it was under the O'Malley administration uh, about 10, 12 years ago. Uh, and most of the Nanticoke itself uh, is within a sanctuary, which means there are no public commercial harvest allowed there now. The idea of that program was to take about 25% of the oyster beds in the state and make them sanctuary. And the only harvest um, that can happen there is if it's through aquaculture, which requires uh, people to lease the bottom and plant a certain amount every year back on the bottom. 
Um, there's a conflict remaining between the public with wild fishery and um, aquaculture uh, leasing. And that's playing out right now and some different uh, uh, decision-making struggles about uh, what ground is open for leasing. I won't go into that right now. And let me see if I can get to the next slide. Why didn't I pay attention? Is it this one? Okay. Uh, there's a shot of the nanocoke and uh, those little blue triangles uh, that you see down uh, from that pink uh, shaded area down are um, historic oyster bars. And there are also within the, uh, upstream of those bars, there's a tremendous amount of uh, area that's been uh, leased and uh, planted with uh, shell. Anybody have any questions now? So I can, uh, uh, before I go on to my next of the big three. You hear me, Lisa? Yep, I hear you. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat right really now. You guys, we can all hear you guys. Just continue on. We don't have any questions in the chat right now. She muted. Can, can you hear me, Lisa? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. All right. If there's no questions, I'm going to move on because I can't hear uh, I can't hear you talking to me. So, so I'm going to move on to uh, uh, the next segment here. And of course, blue crabs are the uh, iconic fishery in Maryland now. What happened when that oyster uh, fishery collapsed um, around 1980 is that uh, watermen started targeting crabs and trying to make a living, um, expanding the season that they worked, expanding the gear that they fished. And uh, the crab fishery, if you look at statistics, you would think, wow, starting in about 1979 or 1980, all of a sudden there was a lot more crabs. That's really not very likely. What happened was as people had to drop out of oystering, they started crabbing longer seasons, crabbing more gear, and the crab harvest went up. But anytime when you take two fisheries and you eliminate one of them, then you create the potential for over harvest in the, in the remaining fishery. And that, in, in my view, is what ha has happened with blue crabs. And now you see the part of the slide says, and the Nanacoke and Tangier Sound below it is a major part of the overall crab population. Uh, of course, so you've got uh, Tangier Sound, you've got uh, Chris Field, you've got um, Smith Island, You've got uh, that whole expanse of water is prime crab territory. So a tremendous part of the overall crab population uh, comes from the Nanacoke and below the Nanacoke, where the, where the Nanacoke drains Tangier Sound. Uh, in terms of crab numbers, they vary wildly. Why is that? It's because the crab is an ocean spawner and uh, the amount of baby crabs that come into bay every year has lots to do with the way the wind's blowing uh, in the spring when those babies hatch. Uh, all the silks, the female crabs, go down to around the bridge tunnel in the Cape Charles area. They bury down for the winter and then they rub their eggs off in the spring. And those larvae, when they hatch, um, if the winds are south and southeast, uh, during the bulk of that uh, hatch, then those babies will be pushed into the Chesapeake. But if the winds are out of the north or the uh, northwest uh, for the prevailing winds, a lot of that larvae is washed out to sea, uh, doesn't survive, and maybe some of it is pushed down further towards North Carolina and those areas. As I said, uh, blue crabs are Maryland's most iconic and commercially and important fishery. It's not even close in terms of economic 
value of the crab fishery and the oyster fishery anymore. Uh, crab fishery uh, probably producing uh, five, four to five times what the oyster fishery does in terms of poundage and in terms of uh, dollars. Uh, I mentioned that the increased effort in the crab fishery and consumer demand, more efficient harvest technology introduces danger of overfishing. Uh, there's a lot of figures uh, that they use to regulate um, that the Maryland Department of Natural Resources uses to regulate uh, the crab fishery. And it's all based on uh, what's called the winter uh, dredge survey, uh, where they go uh, hundreds of sites all around the bay. They, they drag a crab dredge, they count what comes up and they categorize what they find um, according to year class and uh, male, female. And the, the, most of the regulation depends on, um, depends on what, what, how many mature females they find. I'm gonna give you just a few figures on that. Uh, Total crabs, I'm, not, I'm talking about, uh, uh, it was, I guess, uh, Mr. Kaufman earlier had a figure on total crabs in the bay. And uh, total crabs in the bay is in the, uh, was about approximately 400 million, that's individual crabs in 2020, but that was down from 700 million in, uh, uh, in 1990. So the total biomass is down. Um, and the percentage of adult spawning females uh, uh, in, in 20, uh, 2019 was 191 uh, million. And it dropped this last year to 141 million. Uh, to put that in perspective, uh, these new regulations that where Maryland regulates the industry uh, calls for a, a I'm going to go to the next slide because I think I have something on there with that. Why is that not going? Um, so the, the target for the state is uh, 215 million adult females. Uh, that's what they want to see in the Bay. That would be wonderful. Uh, however, uh, as I said, it's about, it was 141 million in 2020. And that target in the last 30 years has only been achieved three times. Now I need to jump ahead. Um, Sydney, can you help me? I don't know why it's hung up. I just hit that and won't move. Uh, okay, I'm hoping you're hearing me. And what you'll see on this graph is a uh, a wide variation. I think I hopefully explain that in terms of the amount of crabs that get into the bay of tiny baby crabs based on where they spawn uh, and the confluence of the bay and the ocean. Uh, in terms of crab uh, survival though, once the babies are in the ocean, that depends on habitat. That depends on water quality. And even though a crab's a tough customer and they can survive in some pretty polluted waters, uh, habitat in terms of the grasses that are on the bottom is a huge, huge factor. And unfortunately, um, what's uh, been happening uh, just in the last couple years has me very worried about crab habitat. Uh, there's something called eelgrass. And um, I'm going to make a little plug right now for a publication I take called Bay Journal. Bay Journal is a, uh, it's an independent environmental newspaper for the Chesapeake region. 
And th their latest issue, January, February 2021, documented something that I've seen that troubled me greatly, which is loss of the major submerged aquatic vegetation in the mid bay. And that's this eel grass. That is the grass that the, uh, grows that the baby crabs live in. And of course, not only baby crabs, uh, rockfish and other species. Uh, but because of increased water temperature, and which is at least partly due to global warming, that eelgrass has died off big time in the middle bay. And there's some grasses in the upper bay that are doing better. Uh, but air grass, I'm going to say from the Bay Bridge down to uh, clear down to the Maryland line, our primary grass is the eel grass. It's in real big trouble. And that does not bode well for really striped bass or blue crabs. Okay, now I'm going on to the third and the big three, the striped bass. And uh, you may know that the Chesapeake provides great majority of the striper population for the entire Atlantic. Uh, the striped bass, most of them spawn in the Chesapeake and the Nanticoke is one of the four major spawning areas in the Chesapeake. So when they do something called the Young of Year survey each year, when DNR does that to try to find out how many uh, baby stripers uh, have hatched that year, they have four sites that they test in the Nanticoke. Uh, back in the day, I, I uh, can recall stories of people who were uh, canoeing and kayaking uh, up in the Nanticoke, up towards Riverton and areas maybe upstream from there anything above uh, Vienna. And the, the striped bass were so thick in places that when you put your canoe paddle down, you would hit a, the back of a striper. Uh, that's not the case right now. And uh, in terms of the, the striper population, it has been very, uh, it's varied really wildly, wildly over the years. Um, it got so bad in the late in the 80s that the state stepped in, eliminated all fishing for five years uh, from 1985 to 89. It was a five year total moratorium, sport fishing, uh, commercial fishing. Uh, well, the fish rebounded. There was what's called a dominant year class in that. I think it was around 87, 88. And there was a great spawn. and because nobody was taking any, uh, those, those fish uh, that were spawned then, they got to grow up and reach spawning age, which was about three years, and they respawned. So then we had a, a vibrant population of, of uh, stripers in the bay and started up our fisheries again with heavy regulation. There, there's never been unlimited catches since that time. Um, and in terms of how uh, rockfish catches are uh, regulated by the state, you, you, ha you have, for the watermen, you have a strict poundage quota. Uh, it's based on your history, uh, your catch history is reported in catch reports. And you get each waterman who has a commercial license gets a poundage quota for the year and they get enough tags uh, to put a tag on every fish they catch uh, based on that quota. And th they call this ITQ system. It's used in other fisheries, uh, particularly out in Alaska. And um, one of the good things that that system has done is it's allowed your, your quota to, to be valuable. You can uh, sell your quota to another fisherman. You can lease it by the year. And, uh, but what that has accomplished, other than some uh, outlaws who have tried to violate it, which has not been the case so much lately, um, that the commercial fisheries really 
they have a real good handle on how many rockfish are being taken. Uh, that's not the case with the sport fishery and um, the sport fishery is very important. Uh, and you see that it's a multi-billion dollar industry when you count the boats and the tourists. And I, I, I myself participate in the sport fishery because I'm a charter boat captain part-time. So that sort of mixes the, um, the sport fishery and the commercial fishery. I make money taking people out to catch fish as well as certain times of the year, I catch some and sell them. Uh, just like what's happening with the crabs, only more so the stress on stripers today is due to an increased water temperature. That, that leads to a lack of oxygen. Fish can't breathe if there's not oxygen. And there's another problem with the food that the rockfish eat, uh, uh, the menhaden, which is their favorite food, what we call L-wives, have been depleted to the point where they're considering a moratorium on menhaden fishing right now. But all those factors have put stress on the stripers. And, and one thing the states just learned is it's hard to calculate the mortality that's caused by the sport fishing industry or the people out sport fishing. They can't even really count how many they are. But when they release undersized fish, a lot of those fish in the hot summer months end up dying. So in recent last couple of years, the sport fishing season has been cut back. The daily limit has been cut back from two fish to one. And of course, that doesn't make anybody happy uh, uh, that they can't even bring two rockfish ashore if they're lucky enough to catch some. Uh, some folks, some of the, con the fisheries conservation organizations feel we may be teetering on the verge of another striper population collapse. I certainly hope that's not the case, but what we really need now is a, a dominant year class where these fish that come this spring into the Nanico can go up there to Riverton and all those areas to spawn, that the water quality is good enough up there that they produce a lot of babies. Last year's, what they call the spawning index was only 2.5. That's when uh, DNR folks drive, drag a seine and bring it to shore and count how many baby rockfish are in it. And the long-term average, I've got 10.5 on the slide. I discovered this morning it should have been 11.5. So that long-term average, 11.5 rockfish for a seine haul, that's all over the bay. Uh, but they keep statistics just for the Nanticoke, just for the Chop Tank, just for the Upper Bay, the Susquehanna, and the Potomac River. Those are the four big spawning areas. Uh, last year in the Nanticoke, the index was only 2.5 babies. And the year before, I think it was three point something. So what that sort of bodes toward is in a few years, three years from now, when those fish would reach uh, harvestable size of at 19 inches, we're gonna see a very scarce uh, amount of fish coming. Here's a, a graph that shows you what I was talking about. And you see that what's sustained us until recently is in the year 2015, that young of the year index was fantastic. Uh, it produced a, a dominant year class then. And you see some other dominant year classes like in um, uh, 94 and 90, 90 or I guess around 2000. Uh, and you see that during the moratorium years, uh, uh, 87 uh, through 90, or I guess it's 85 through 90, look how low the, the, uh, the amount of babies were during that time. It's probably a good thing. I mean, nobody likes a moratorium and nobody likes being told that they can't catch fish. Most of all, a commercial fisherman like me, but it's a good thing they did what they did then or the fishery might have collapsed forever. And at least we've had 30 good years, relatively good of fishing uh, since then, but we're, we're on a 
you know, we're at a tough place now. Okay, I'm going to this one. Okay, uh, if there's no questions, I'm going to give you uh, go to my conclusions about uh, the Nanticoke fisheries, and which are the same as the bay fisheries, because the big three are the same on the Nanticoke as they are all over the Chesapeake. And I guess my first conclusion is, despite most of the harvest figures for all three fisheries trending lower, the bay is still what H.L. Mencken called a world-class protein factory. There's still a lot of stuff out there to be caught. Uh, then I say, however, my research and personal evidence as a waterman leads me to uh, believe all three of Maryland's big fisheries are in decline and they remain in decline. The decline's primarily due to poor water quality and loss of habitat. Particularly worrisome is that uh, loss of uh, submerged aquatic ve vegetation in the, in the middle bay, uh, the eelgrass. Uh, so as fisheries decline, overfishing, which isn't the major factor at first, at least, uh, it's the poor water quality and the loss of habitat. But then as the fisheries are going down, then overfishing occurs to, to get what's left, and that can lead to collapse of species. And in the last 50 years, as I alluded to and earlier, we've seen periods where both the rockfish or the striped bass and the oysters have been what I call commercially extinct. They haven't been extinct and I hope to God they never will be, but uh, they got to the point where you couldn't catch enough oysters to sell and it was down to less than a hundred people oystering on the bay. Uh, and the, the state had to declare a moratorium on the rockfish. Uh, my next conclusion is uh, the bay economy and the culture, meaning the economy of these communities around the bay where the resources are, are predominant, it can't survive on the crab fishery alone. Uh, it's been trying to do so some of these years. It's real tough, and that puts more pressure on the crabs. My last conclusion is uh, I, I, I've tried to stay away from a lot of dollar figures because there's so many out there, but you really can't quantify what a truly healthy bay, like it was 50, 60 years ago, and even more, um, would be. It would be in the trillions of dollars instead of the millions and maybe billions. So here's what I'm hoping for. In the short term, just in the next year, two years, that the end of the COVID epidemic will bolster dollar values of all the fisheries. You know, we had a, I mentioned this in my session on oystering, the oyster, the wholesale oyster market uh, last September collapsed as a result of COVID. Uh, we went from 50 to $60 in 2019 per bushel wholesale to $30 in 2020. And that affected both the aquaculture folks and the wild fishery folks vastly. And it's been so bad that some of the weeks this winter, there's only been oyster market for the wild fishery one or two days a week. The state allows you right now to go four days a week, but Woodermen haven't been able to sail those days, some of those days, because they've got no market. Uh, another thing I'm hoping for is organizations like the NWA at when COVID ends, we'll be able to expand their programs and help achieve the needed awareness and policy changes. And of course, we heard about environmental tourism uh, with a gentleman talking about the birding and uh, environmental tourism, recreational uh, 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 fisheries will bounce back. That's uh, an economic benefit that we can hope for even you know, in the next six months. Uh, Long-term, what I'm hoping for is a change in the federal administration will result in renewed focus on the environment and resources and environmental value of the Bay. One of the things I've noticed that gives me a lot of hope is that uh, young people around the world and their activism for climate change will lead to policy changes and prevent global disaster 
in, in economic res and environmental resources. And I guess if that all happens, the 50 year struggle to save the Bay will finally lead to a recognizable improvement. It seems like what we've been doing for 50 years is treading water and maybe we've kept it from getting worse, but I'd like to see it get recognizably better and then our national treasure would be restored. That's all I have. And I hope there's some questions. Not even sure if you're hearing me. So fire away if you've got one. I have one for you. Okay. We hear uh, Fred, but I don't know if Fred hears us. Um, so Sydney's gonna ask him one or two of the questions. There, it's complicated like all environmental things, but the biggest threat right now for the eelgrass is the water temperature. And uh, also runoff and turbidity. Um, the, that eelgrass is basically a, a cooler water grass. And we were at the sort of Southern edge of the range of eelgrass. And uh, what we had starting in 2017 uh, was a tremendous amount of rain, record amount of rain. And we also had hot water. And that just put the kibosh on eelgrass. And then that continued into 2018. So we had two tough years there on eelgrass. Now, as I said, not all the grasses, are, there's five types. You can get all this from the Bay Journal. I'm putting it up there again because there's an excellent article about the grasses in the Bay and sort of hoisting the warning flag about this eelgrass uh, disappearance. But, um, the, the runoff from excessive rainfall, the turbidity clouds the water. And because the eelgrass is surviving in the water, it needs extra light. And when the water's thick, and I've noticed this myself in the last couple of years, we had some years even within the last 10. And I think this was due to the increase in the oysters and the oysters filtering the water. We had some years where uh, the water was getting clearer not like it used to be because in the fall, I used to be able to go out fishing and uh, around James Island, the mouth of the uh, little chop tank and see down 15 feet to the bottom or sometimes even more, nothing like that. But it was more like you could see down six and eight, maybe 10 feet last two years, even once the water got cooler, you, you've not been able to see any, any sort of distance underwater. So uh, for the eelgrass, We've got to hope for a little bit drier weather and we got to hope for a little bit cooler weather. I don't mean as cool as it is in Texas right now, but uh, we need water temperatures not over the mid 80s. And they've been up in the upper 80s in the last couple summers, at least for part of the summer. Anything else? I think that's it. Um, we had uh, Mike, who is the SAV guy, the Rivergrass guy for Maryland. And he uh -huh. put a link on the chat. So if anyone wants to check that out, he's a great resource and that's more information. Um, I don't know that there was any other questions. Let's see. I think that's it. Um, are there any other questions for Fred? Hey, I wanna thank Sydney for help. Somebody talking. I, <laughs> I wanna thank Sydney for helping me try to get through this. She's been a great help. I mean, uh, thank you. Thank you, Fred. Um, really quick before we finish, um, Randall is with the Chesapeake Conservancy and he asked if you could have a few moments just to update on a really cool project that's happening in Seaford. Sure. You're gonna have to click, unmute yourself there, Randall. Very good, thank there you. you. Go. Um, that would be useful to have at least a couple of minutes on what we're doing in Seaford. I'm going to try to share this. This we're building an oyster house park in Seaford. Many of you may know this about this. We bought this acre of land and we're reconstructing it and we're naming it the oyster house park, which I, I suspect will, uh, uh, please Fred because back in the late 18, last half of the 1800s, um, Seaford was really the major uh, shipping point for uh, oysters north, primarily because of the train station that came through Seaford. 
we have started, we've broken ground on this brown area that, that hopefully you can see here over the water. This is a $1.2 million project to try to stabilize the shoreline here and offer an extension of the river walk um, in Seaford itself. At the bottom of the screen is going to be a, a deck that could be used to, we eventually hope to be able to have kayaks, a kayak launching machine here. You put in your credit card like you would to rent a bicycle and get a kayak and take it out. Um, but you can also bring your own kayaks down here. There's an amphitheater at the bottom. Um, and the deck will be used for performances to the amphitheater as well. So it's going to be a multi-purpose um, park, Oyster House Park, that we're, we hope this first phase will be finished. Well, it will be this summer. And uh, they're, they're working on it now for any of those of you that live in Seaford. I think the other thing that uh, is worth noting is that the Chesapeake Conservancy, working with our partners, has... Um, um, protected 19,300 acres of the habitat on the Nanticoke watershed. Um, that's 33% of the land on the Nanticoke watershed has been protected versus 22% within the Chesapeake Bay watershed and only 12% nationally. So um, the Nanticoke is really uh, we're doing a lot to protect the pristine nature of the Nanticoke. As everyone on this call understands, it's, it really is a major tributary to the Chesapeake and one that deserves to be, uh, continue to be protected. Um, if anybody wants to know more about what we're doing in the Chesapeake or the, at the Oyster House Park, uh, perhaps you could contact me after this and because I know we're running out of time. I will leave a, an email address um, on the chat and, uh, and you can contact me if you'd like. That, that's all I've got, thanks. Thank you so much, Randall, for that update. Um, so I just wanna close by saying thank you so much to all of our different presenters. I know you took time out of your day to be here, but also to create your PowerPoints and gather the information and we really appreciate it. And I think um, one of the themes I heard uh, resoundingly, you know, through and through the different presentations is that the economics and the environment don't have to be mutually exclusive, that um, we really can have both. We can have it all here on the Nanticoke. And, um, and I'm really um, thankful because there have been so many great partners that we've had here at the Nanticoke Watershed Alliance, both corporate and NGO, that have really done a lot to work together to try to find some good economic uh, common sense solutions to some of our issues. So thank you all for attending.